Good evening. Today is Monday, June 4th, 2018. This is the Cabarrus County Board of Education work session and public hearing. The public hearing uh, will start uh, after the work session and no earlier than 6.30 p.m. I would like to welcome our uh, SRO, uh, Brian Hines from Northwest Middle School and Deputy Holmes from A.T. Allen and Mary Frances Wall. Thank you both for being here. Board members, um, I will take a motion to uh, adopt the agenda. We would like to move item three reports until after the consent agenda. So we'll cover those items first, then we'll go into the report by staff. Do I have a motion to approve with that modification? I'm Chairman, so move. Second. Okay, Dr. Kirk made the motion. Mr. Shoemaker seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Huh? Oh, Mr. Harrison, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Harrison seconded. Uh, motion carries 7 0. Thank you. So we will go down to item 4.01, the budget amendments with um, Ms. Klutz. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We have three budget amendments for your review today. We'll start with the state. Um, as you can see, these are fairly normal budget amendments we have this time of year. Um, additional funds for group homes, additional funds uh, or replacement reimbursement funds uh, for the transportation of early college, uh, reimbursement for substitutes, and at the bottom is um, some additional E-rate funds that come from the state. Are there questions um, on the state budget amendments? Okay, okay. everybody good? Yeah. We will go on to the federal. Most of these are, are small adjustments or reclasses. The first one is an allotment or a grant that we receive for child nutrition equipment. We get those occasionally. We, we're thrilled and excited about that. Um, the others are minor reclass um, due to year-end transactions. Are there any questions on the federal budget amendments? Go on to our final budget amendment for today in capital outlay. You'll see some items that you're familiar with. The first one is actually when DPI purchase bus, purchases buses on a lease for us, they send the payment down and then we record the transaction. Um, then you'll see that um, we recorded additional funds that the county was able to provide for the new Hickory Ridge Elementary School. How many buses was that? Was that? How many? Does it this say? is. Um, I, I don't, don't know right off the top of my head. There's a, it's a four-year lease, so if you multiply that times four and then divide it by about a hundred thousand, you're probably going to be close. So. So the lease cost is a hundred thousand. A bus cost about. <coughs> the bus does. Right? So, um, the lease is a four-year lease. There's very minimal interest. So you know, okay. four times four, sixteen, and then divide it by about a hundred thousand. Probably sixteen buses, I would say be my best guess right now um, so then again we have the uh, additional funds for Hickory Ridge Elementary the next one is the mobile units as we went through our budget process and the county participated they identified and saw our needs and were able to fund that um, in advance of the year which helps us tremendously um, also the next two items the HVAC systems at JM Freeze and Mount Pleasant High School were on our budget list and they were able to fund that in advance also. The, uh, then there's the request for funds to convert Jay and Freeze Middle to a traditional middle school and that provides um, athletic fields and converting some office space to classroom space. And then you'll see the construction, the contingency that we spoke with you last month about. We asked the county for 860000 in contingency here that's recorded. And then the county was able to fund another budget request that we had as sitting through our budget process, um, handrails for Concord High School. Questions on any of those? Okay. I have one question about the um, buses. That's a four-year lease. Yes. Do we then own the buses after that, or does DPI still hold the title to them? No, we own them, um, and then DPI will then replace them, too, after they've met so many mm -hmm. miles or right. years. So it's, it's certainly a great situation for us. Okay. Okay, board members, consent eight, agenda? It was 18 oh, buses. Thank you. 18? 18 buses. Okay. <laughs> Consent agenda board? Consent. Consent? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So they're a little late. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. 
so they're a little less than a hundred thousand if it's 18 then right they, they are 85 i was thinking about when we talked about in our budget committee about the activity buses um, and they have the EC lifts on them, they're closer to 100,000. And so the ones without the lifts, um, the regular yellow school buses are a little less. I think she says 85. And that's what I was thinking. Because I was thinking? about to say they've gone up 20,000. Because no, I thought they, <laughs> last year they were around 80,000. Okay, thank you. But I gather the county is able to respond very quickly to the um, budget items that we did call out this year and um, knock out a big couple chunks. Of those larger us, requests mm -hmm. it helps us tremendously yes if you, you look um, you know seven million dollars in HVAC systems two million dollars in mobiles you know that's a, that's it's a really big deal it's and the timing of it is excellent yes thank you okay we'll move on to the next budget item 4.02 the continuing budget resolution okay and so the budget is um, well underway and, and passed, I think, um, now, but we can't um, process everything in time for a June 30th um, and get you guys to approve that budget. So we need a budget resolution so that we can continue to operate um, as of July the 1st, and then I'll bring the budget to you and you'll pass it in, in the next fiscal year. Okay, consent agenda? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And the next item, we have the policies for approval on second reading. So these are on consent, and we have had no, no communication from anyone. So. so any questions on policy 3530, citizenship and character, education? Okay, consent for that one. Okay, electronically stored information retention. Any questions? Consent? Uh, 3640, 5130, student voter registration and pre registration. Consent. Consent. Student records. Action. I was waiting to see if you were going to catch us. <laughs> no, I was. <laughs> And the fourth policy there is 5030, community use of facilities. Consent? A okay. question on that, though. We've yeah. added something that says polling places on election day uh, in accordance with uh, that statute. Um, <clears throat> and then you did go down a little bit further as far as fees. Are, are we charging for that? Do we get a fee for that, or is that free? Or? Can you repeat that again, please? I'm sorry. Uh, on the item, you added, you've added a number one under B. It says polling places on election day in accordance with uh, 163A-1046. Yeah, we do not charge any fees for that. Okay, so if you go down to that section D that says what we charge and don't charge for, is that consistent? Does it say what it's supposed to say or it's not charged? I think it refers there to a um, sentence right above number one, fees shall be applied uniformly to all groups within a particular user category. So the election days are in their own categories, the way I read that. Is that okay. correct? And yeah, we'd probably defer to our attorney to make sure we're consistent, okay. but I think So I think if we go down to D, do we have a category that says that? That's all. That's so. We can uh, check with uh, Mr. Schwartz and Bring okay. back to well, you. I just, you know, make, make sure, sure it's consistent. consistent and then you can look at that next week if you want. Okay, so you want to put that one on action? Yes. Just to be sure. Okay. And we've never charged for polling place no, sir. activity. Okay. So, Ms. Monroe, we have uh, the first three are consent and the last two are action. Okay, and the last uh, consent agenda possibility there is the board member training for Ms. Carpenter. Um, the one we expect to come out of this year's budget, did you decide, Kelly, if it would be this year's or next year's for her training? The one in particular um, would be this year, and then uh, the one that she's at, she'll need to ask for reimbursement for um, would be next year. Okay. So both. Well, both of those are in July. But we're going to have to prepay your the, the uh, admission for you to go in July now. 
And neither one of those need to be paid now. Okay. If you yeah, the SRA conference, that, that can be paid that day in July. Okay. All okay, right. whichever, she can look at our budget and if we have money left okay. this year, handle it accordingly. Is that okay? Okay. okay. If, if it doesn't need to be paid in advance, then that's fine. Okay. You okay. can do July. Okay, yeah, because they told me I could pay it the day of the conference, which is in July, July the 8th. Okay. Ms. Carpenter, there is one registration for the other conference uh -huh. that will have to be paid in advance. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so one before and one after. Oh, okay. okay. And Madam Chair, it would be my honor to uh, put it on consent for Ms. Carpenter to represent us well yeah, you, for each one of these yeah, things. Yeah, this one, this one is uh, the one they're referring to is safe schools. And this will be, and this will be a conference down. Uh, and this will be a state conference. It'll be mm -hmm. people from all over the state at this point. And I will give a report when I get. So by. the one is an SRO conference, and the other one is a safety summit. Yes, and the uh, SRO is here in Cabarrus County, so that's something local. I'll, I'll just be driving back and forth. And the other one, as I mentioned, will be a state conference. Okay, so we put that one on consent as well. Okay, now we will go back to uh, item. Uh, three, the reports, and for 3.01, the Beverly Hills study recommendation. We'll have staff come up for that. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Uh, tonight, myself, Tim Lauder, and, and Kelly Klutz will be presenting uh, the study and recommendation for Beverly Hills Elementary School. I want to start with a timeline review uh, so we know why we are where we are today. November 2017, the Royal Oaks Boundary Committee recommended Scenario E, which consolidated Beverly Hills Elementary School with Royal Oaks Elementary in Wonkoff. The superintendent accepted Scenario E and recommended that to the Board of Education. In December of 2017, based on K-3 legislation and many unknown factors, the superintendent recommended to the board that we withdraw that recommendation uh, for Royal Oaks Elementary School and delay it for a year. In February of 2018, the Board of Education approved a 10-year plan which included a recommended consolidation of Beverly Hills Elementary School. And this past May, our district realignment committee began the redistricting process for elementary, middle, and high. Anytime a board considers the closure or consolidation of a facility or school, uh, the statute requires the board consider primarily the welfare of students to be affected by the proposed closing or consolidation and that the study should include, among other factors, geographic conditions, anticipated increases or decreases in school enrollment, the inconvenience or hardship that might result for pupils to be affected by such closing or consolidation, the cost of providing additional school facilities in the event of such closing or consolidation, and such other factors as the board shall consider germane. And those are the items that uh, staff will be addressing for you tonight. The data points and information that staff used uh, for our recommendation fall in three major buckets. The first one will be student impact. Uh, I will address those for you tonight. The second bucket is facility analysis, and Mr. Tim Lauder will address those. And the final one is a financial impact, and Ms. Kelly Klutz will uh, address those topics. Under student impact, for me, we'll be discussing the welfare of students. We'll talk about inconvenience and hardship to students and parents. We'll talk about course offerings and program choice options. We'll look at school enrollment over time and possible projections for the next 10 years. Transportation, specifically to safety and efficiency. Realignment uh, in conjunction with geographic conditions. So our first one is our welfare of our students. Cabarrus County Schools student welfare is our number one priority. Uh, providing adequate facilities for all of our students is extremely important, alleviating the sharing of resources, especially in our smaller schools, creating accessibilities for all students. If you look at this picture, you can see the sidewalk that goes down to the playground at Beverly Hills. Obviously, that's not ADA accessible, and that's just one of the many different um, situations at Beverly Hills where students are, uh, do not have ADA access. And then creating a learning environment that's appropriate for elementary students in the 21st century, creating a, a learning space that, that all students and parents should want their kids in. Can you elaborate on the leaving, uh, sharing of resources, sorry. Sure, when we have smaller schools, uh, it's much more difficult to allot a full-time 
technology facilitator or a full-time uh, counselors in full-time different positions. So we share a lot of different positions at our smaller schools. And so sometimes our resources are then having to be shared um, because they don't have enough students in there to allot them a full position and or sometimes, and, and Ms. Klutz can speak a little bit more to the financial side, but sometimes even uh, financial resources are less. Because student, we, we allot money as, as well based on ADM. Inconvenience and hardship. Throughout the past year, uh, we've gotten feedback from the community as expressed during our public hearings, our school site meetings, direct communication via email, phone calls, just as the board has received those. What we've heard is that there's a great affection for the Beverly Hills uh, Elementary School from that community. Families have a history with that school. Uh, they feel like moving the school or consolidating it would uh, take away the neighborhood feel. Uh, they wouldn't be able to walk to and from school anymore that commute times for students could possibly change, and that the transition from a small school to a larger school could be a concern for them. Of course, offers, offerings and program choice options, there are uh, no impacts to course offerings. They would be receiving the exact same thing they have currently. Student options for program choice will be provided at the following schools. The STEM would be provided at Weinkauf Elementary. Students that would choose IB would go to Irvin. Students that would want fine arts would go to Royal Oaks. Students will continue to have access to all program choice options. And our final school assignments will be determined by a realignment process for the 2019-2020 school year. So where all the students will go will be determined by that committee and this board. So school enrollment over time. This is a chart that shows our projected enrollment done by uh, McKibben Demographics. Uh, this is a chart uh, that shows the resident students. These are students that live in the Beverly Hills boundary without magnet students included. Um, basically, uh, this number, as you can see, you see the total across the bottom starting with 345. It fluctuates a little bit, but stays within 10 to 15 students for the next 10 years. Uh, also to be noted, Beverly Hills currently has approximately 47 students that reside or live in the Beverly Hills boundary but choose to go to other schools. And so that number as we would move through the next 10 years would also have to be deducted if that were to stay consistent um, with, with students choosing to leave. Transportation as it's uh, related to safety and efficiency. Uh, when we talked to our transportation department, they said they would definitely have a safer uh, bus parking and, and staging areas. Pants drop off would be much less congested and, uh, congested and would not interfere with the bus operations as much. School buses would not uh, be subject to small loading and unloading spaces. Efficiency of the buses, uh, it will fit within the tier bus plan and not affect that current schedule. Ride times would not change dramatically uh, due to the relocation of students and current Beverly Hills Elementary buses would be reassigned to the proposed attendance areas. No additional equipment or needs would be anticipated given our current program choice um, system. <coughs> Finally, realignment and geographic conditions. Uh, the Board of Education has given the following criteria to the realignment committee as it relates to geographic conditions. As I uh, stated before, we'll be realigning and looking at elementary, middle, and high boundaries all together. And uh, the criteria are uh, close proximity, students should be assigned to the school where they are closest to their homes and maximizing bus efficiencies and transportation of students, making every effort to account for transportation. That means parent commutes, car riders, balancing bus and travel time, and cost. All of this information can be found on our website. Uh, it is up, up to date and current and will continue uh, at the link that's provided in this PowerPoint. This time I'm going to ask Mr. Lowder to step up and, and talk to the facility analysis. Thank you. Under the feasibility analysis, we're going to cover a, a couple of items. Uh, several of these studies were done over the last few years. We're going to look at <coughs> the feasibility cost analysis done by DPI, uh, the Fannie Howey study that was created in 2014. We're going to look at uh, repair costs versus renovation costs and replacement costs. And we're going to address the cost of repairs and renovations and, and how they relate to one another. We're also going to talk a little bit about the new construction cost and, and how it aligns with our five-year and ten-year plan. 
as far as our uh, these points will be covered within uh, the, the project I just I just just talked about this. I'll not talk about this slide. I just told you that from the previous slide. But anyway, I'll start off with the feasibility study, uh, the Fannie and Howie study. The Fannie and Howie study was, uh, we realized in 2013-14 that we were way behind on our deferred maintenance within the system. And the board did a, a contract with Fannie and Howie to come in and do a comprehensive study of all of our schools. Well, not all of our schools. They did 31 of our schools at that time. Several schools were not done because they were already scheduled for replacement or already had a, another independent study going or they were actually too new to the system to require an extensive study on, on deferred maintenance. However, uh, they did 31 of those schools and they, they, they set up a priority of what needed to be done within the system to replace things that were at or beyond their present life cycle. Several of them were you know, well beyond their life cycle. Some of them were very near the life cycle. So they gave us a five-year plan of that replacement of those components within the building. And they also talked about portions of our building that did not meet certain standards. We had to make some adjustments to those once we entered into the Fannie and Howie study to, to bring these up to some current standards. In some cases, you can't just go in and replace a component and not do some work to bring it up to, to, to code. So therefore, it did have kind of a mixed use of cost there. Anyway, pulling all those items together, uh, for Beverly Hills Elementary School was a total of ten million three hundred thousand dollars. Okay. What does the VFA abbreviation mean? The VFA software is a uh, software that they they had developed that allowed them to go in and it was a tablet form that allowed them to go in and pick components. Their own, that was their own. Software? That was their own software. Yes, sir. And just to clarify, that ten million three hundred was in twenty fourteen dollars. Yes, sir. At that time, it was twenty fourteen. Yes, sir. And a, a complete, that, that summary study is in Appendix E for you, should you need to see it. And the repair costs, uh, repair costs are a little different from the Fannie and Howie. It is a basis of where we re, uh, did our repair costs. Each year, our maintenance department goes through and looks at the total capital needs and, and begins with what needs to be replaced and what does not really need to be replaced. Stuff like, you know, major components, water systems, HVAC, uh, things like that. Uh, obviously, AD, ADA accessibility, that sort of thing. And, our, and of that list, between 2018 and 2017 to 2020-24, we have a, a very comprehensive list of what was included in our budget request to the county for replacement and repairs needed at, at North uh, Beverly Hills Elementary School. Now, you understand that some of the things on the Fannie Howie study have been taken care of, but then as four years later, there's other things been added to the list. So this is, this is our uh, total value of Ten million six hundred seven thousand dollars. Example: of Some of those components are, just for example, the top picture there is a piece of piping that we removed from the distribution system going in to Beverly Hills Elementary School. It was replaced this past year. It still was built with galvanized pipe. Well, galvanized pipe over time obviously corrodes, and you can see how how small that opening is just based on the corrosion there. That's been replaced. However, a large portion of this building plumbing system is underneath existing concrete slab and therefore inaccessible. So, therefore, in order to replace the entire Plumbing under that building is very expensive, and, that, and it reflects so in our in one of our maintenance costs. The second one, you know, our boilers—they're there. We've been repairing them. We keep them up, but they they drip, they, they drop. But we just have improvised and created an alternate solution to keep them going till it's replaced. So therefore, you see, we create a piping system that just allows it to continue to leak and just run over over time. Same thing with some of our HVA systems and stuff like that. So, therefore. The whole point is, this is repair cost, okay? This is not total renovation. This is to repair things that need to be fixed on this site, okay? It does not include components bring it, to bring it up to code. Now, we get into the cost of feasibility analysis. It allows us to look at some of those items that need to be taken care of to bring the building up to code. This is a state uh, DPI form that we have to use for our guidelines to determine whether this is a candidate for renovation, or is it a candidate for replacement, or, or whatever. And in doing so, it has a, it's a checklist within the form itself, and you go parts 1A and parts uh, 2A and 2B, you go in and assign points to different components of the building and the site. Once you reach that total points, then you evaluate it. In this particular case, the score required to move forward with a renovation, according to the state guidelines, is 18. Beverly Hills received a score of four. On the site side of that analysis, which is not on the sheet, they had to receive a score of a seven or more 
and received a score of seven, which means it's very marginal as to whether or not you can actually use this site for a replacement site should you wish to replace it. Okay. Who performed this analysis? This analysis is done in-house. Okay. We sit down and done that and then also worked in conjunction with some of our previous bids and we just taken them on, on cost of components and that sort of thing. And then the form is set up to do just that. Yeah. The form of the state created the form for you as a school system to be able to sit down and do this analysis for you. But during that <coughs> analysis, look at all the different uh, functions that have to be done. There's some functional improvements that need to take be necessary just to make the building function well. Uh, you know, changes to corridors, access, ADA, expanding bathrooms, those sort of things. Those are things that have to be done in order to make it more functional to meet the, you know, today's standards as far as DPS is concerned. You obviously have some building code and safety improvements which are, are pretty extensive as well. The total, including well, one, one, one item here is a small hazardous uh, material movement because we do have some of our, in order to be able to do some of the replacements, we have to go in and remediate some of the existing materials that was used in 1953, and they're still there. As long as you don't disturb them, they're fine. But once you start renovations, you do have to mitigate those and take those out of service. But the total cost, including architectural design fees and contingency fees, and those, those percentages that are set by DPI within that form, total of $23,790,000. So it's significantly higher than just the repair costs in order to bring the building totally up to code. But it includes the repair cost in it? Yes. That would, that would, uh, if you did everything on this list, it would cover you're all the repair it. costs, the deferred maintenance costs. Okay. And I know you're talking about dollars here, but what would be the timeline and the number of months or days, hours or seconds to um, uh, implement um, this renovation? It would probably be at least a two-year renovation. Yeah, a 24-month cycle because one you have to demolish and remove everything and then start back and build new and like i said before most of the components within here a lot of the components are just not accessible yeah. can't get to them but they're under the slabs you have to tear the slab out to get to them. Uh, some of the expansions you would have to deal with just building expansions you have to make in order to accommodate restroom expansions or or, certain, or ada access some some way to try to create some kind of ramping system which on this site based on the X, Y, and Z and vertical dimensions of the school are, are pretty darn impossible. You know, so the entire facility would be closed down, hypothetically, theoretically? If you, if you, if you chose to renovate. For that, 24, move, for that move, 24 months? Yes, you would have to move away off site to do that, yes, sir. Thank you. One question I have. There's no way to use any of the existing building at all if you, I mean, you know, I know there was a newer part of that building. There, I mean, the back part of the building, you could not utilize that part of the building at all. Oh, no, then we you're, we you're saying. That, no, I mean, that, that portion of the building could be salvaged and saved. It is, a, it is built back in the 90s and is in, in pretty good shape. As a matter of fact, you're looking through the uh, Fanning Howie study, it does give points to that portion of the building being in good shape. Other components were built in 1953 are not so good. So they would, you know, there's, there's a, definitely a, a wide range. There's actually three three different ages of that building. The original start in 53, 63, and then of course in the 90s. So yes, there are components of the building that can be used. What you get into sometimes is trying to utilize it. what's there. It's like kind of like the tail wagging the dog. You're trying to build around what's there and, and it costs you more just to be able to utilize what's there because of where it is. And it may not be in a great location to be able to utilize it. So you end up spending more money trying to use what you had versus just demolishing and start over. It, uh, I'll give an example of Royal Oaks. We were able to do that. We had a portion of the building, we were able to do it, and we were able to be able to, based on where it sat on the site, was able to design around that to be able to actually use that as a component of the building without a lot of extra expense. In this case here, it might be a little more difficult simply because it's two-story and it, it doesn't access but from the top and the bottom, it doesn't really access both ways. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Replacement cost. <clears throat> Obviously, we go through the same calculator uh, through the replacement cost. Uh, right now, current, Royal Oaks is, oh yeah, Beverly Hills, I'm sorry. We've got to talk about Royal Oaks a moment. Uh, Beverly Hills is 49,600 square feet to house the students. That is well below DPI standards for the size of school it needs to be to be able to house 400 students. If you replace it today based on new class sizes and the requirements for the, for the classroom sizes, it would need to be 75,000 square feet. Currently we're seeing in the construction market a cost of about $230 per square foot for that replacement cost to do total new construction. 
So if you put that into play with the, the, the 75,000 square feet, $230 square feet, we do have some land costs that should you uh, try to utilize that site, which uh, would be a little bit difficult because there's some demolition work and there's also some retaining walls necessary in order to create enough building area. You can imagine the 49,000 square feet going to 75,000 square feet, we almost have a 50% increase in footprint in order to try to fit in the same space. Obviously, there have to be some adjustments made to the land. The total cost for re replacement for a 400 student school would be $20,960,000, which is obviously less than renovation costs. So it is not a candidate for renovation. So in summary, I threw out a lot of numbers in repairs. Depending on how we study, $10.3 million was fix what's broken or at near its life cycle. Okay. It may not be broken today, but it may be well beyond its life cycle so it could break any day. Kind of like driving your car on 100,000 mile tires. It may make it to the next trip, but it may blow out just as easy as it makes it to the trip. That's kind of an analogy, if you wish. Capital repairs, again, that is repairing what needs to be fixed or what is broken. <coughs> replacement of windows, replacement of HVAC system, mm -hmm. water system, that sort of thing. That's what the repair costs, $10.6 million. <coughs> Renovation costs, 23.8, and replacement costs of basically $21 million. So those are the four numbers you see, and that's how they line up and how the, what they represent. Okay. <coughs> Construction costs. Um, we also look at, you know, based on what it costs you to build a new school and, and what we have spent in the past. WR Dodell was built at a very good market. It was a very good construction climate at that point in time. It's a 941 student school. We built it for, uh, basically, this is building cost only. Okay, it doesn't include furniture and architectural fees and all that sort of thing. I'm just doing building cost to building cost so that we have oranges and apples here. It was $18,600,000 for a cost of about $20,000, $21,000 per student seat. Royal Works we're currently building has a capacity of 750 students. Uh, it has a cost of $21 million, you know, about $20, $29,000 per seat. Our new Southwest Elementary School, unfortunately, was not in, in a favorable construction market, but it has 941 students. It's going to cost $26,551,000 for uh, 941 student school, which is about $29,000. Now, we estimate based on replacement for R. Brown McAllister and Culture and Web Elementary Schools on their existing sites. They have a little bit more favorable sites as far as rebuilding on it. However, you can see that the cost of the size and the cost of construction in an urban environment is significantly higher. We're averaging about $37,000, $38,000 per seat. Beverly Hills, with 400 students, which is significantly smaller than the rest of them, having a, a, a cost of, of construction of $17,600,000 has a total seat cost of $46,373 per, per, per student. So uh, a quite a bit higher as far as cost to replace that smaller school on that site. <coughs> North Carolina Department of uh, Instruction requires every year that we complete a, a, a study on what our facility needs are. And they cr create a, a form that we fill out that, that talks about what repairs need to be made, what additions need to be made, what new schools uh, uh, needs to be done to add seats to your system. And you file it with the DPI every five years. DPI uses that basically as a, a planning tool. It allows them to go to legislation and says, you know, we have X number of needs within our school system. So we do it for every single school, uh, every single building we do. However, we did one for uh, our facilities need uh, for Beverly Hills. And it does not have a component for the facility's needs because it was based on Fannie and Howie study and based on our feasibility study, it was so closed facility. So therefore, we do not have one for the actual uh, capacity needs for that school. However, on the survey needs, um, so we also didn't have one for Royal Oaks. We also didn't have one for Mount Pleasant Middle School because all those schools were actually under replacement. So therefore, you do not have one of that. But we send one of those to the school every year, and when you do the, the form work, it does, it does show us that we would close that facility. It has been for the last two times we've done it. The 10-year plan um, that was approved by the board uh, it does not include any definitive plans for reuse of the Beverly Hill facility, but it does have the recommendation 
that we close that facility and consolidate, consolidate that facility, I guess is the way to say it, not close it, consolidate that facility with Royal Oaks with some options. I gave you several options, I think, within the 10-year plan to be able to renovate that school for a future purpose. Okay. Mr. Louder, um, just to kind of stay on the subject, um, a few weeks or months ago we had some discussions on the new elementary school, um, Southwest Elementary School, and the additional costs that were unanticipated at that school, mainly because of steel and labor. Um, are these scenarios that you're laying out here also based on those current costs of, of um, products and supplies and, and uh, skilled labor to have you, I'm sure you have, but uh, have you um, baked in all of those current um, expenses into these uh, projections? Sir, what, what we did was um, we calculated the square footage necessary and we used the current construction market analysis that shows the average school going for about $230 per square foot. And that's regional or nationwide or southeast? That's state. Or state. And ours was right at right at 230 is ours well uh, for the uh, Hickory Ridge Elementary School was right at two, 229. Pretty much by the same uh, yardstick? Yes, sir. It fell right in line, so we feel pretty comfortable using 230. Now, a year from now, two years from now, that market may change, yep. and it would not be. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to do it on today's dollar. By, by current yes, sir. expenses. Yes, sir. Okay. With that, I'm going to turn over to Ms. Klutz to uh, talk to you a little bit about the financial impact of, of the school itself. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, I need this back. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so finally, um, we'll talk about the financial impact um, of some of these items. So initially, maintenance costs, then operating costs, personnel consolidation savings, and then the additional school facility costs. So starting um, with our maintenance costs, um, we looked at the average uh, elementary school in Cabarrus County Schools, and I'll take you over to the fourth column over where it says maintenance costs per square foot. So if we look at the cost, um, for our average elementary, we're looking at 20 cent per square foot per normal elementary in the, in the district. Energy cost, $1.11 per square foot, and then student costs or maintenance costs by student per student is $161.38. You can see the corresponding numbers below for Beverly Hills specifically. Um, 64 cent per square foot of maintenance cost. Um, the energy cost is, is in line with the, the average, and then the cost per student for maintenance cost is also elevated at 207. Those true averages, um, or was there some school that was very high and some other school that was very low that you took out, or is it an average of all elementary schools? Average of all of the Cabarrus County schools that we have, elementary schools. I took out the middle and high school, but this is all of the elementary schools. And so that's the average of those. Okay. Then we want to take a look at operating costs. There's a lot of numbers on here, so I'll try to walk you through it. Um, the first column, 2016-2017 expense, that's the general ledger expense. That's for things that it takes to operate that school on a daily basis, like teachers and teacher assistants, staff, utilities, those type things. So if you'll sit, you'll notice in the Harrisburg, elementary line item um, and let me just note the 2016-17 year data was used because we've not completed 17-18 and we want a full picture representation of the the expense so we want you to we want to be able to see um, the cost per student based on the capacity of the building we also want to see the cost per student based on the average daily membership and for folks that are not familiar with our terminology, average daily membership is just the number of seats, or children in seats at one particular time. So for 16-17, Harrisburg had 1,035 um, students in seats. Their program capacity is what their building was programmed for, that's 988, so you can see that that school is over capacity. You see that their per pupil expense um, by, based on their average daily membership is 4,136. And while if it were at uh, program capacity, it would be $4,333. Um, as we look at the other schools, and we'll, we'll compare in relation, but what, what this slide is telling you is if we um, maximize utilization of our 
current schools, then our per cost uh, per student is lower. And you can see that going through, through the slides. Um, Beverly Hills is about at capacity. Um, so their per pupil expense is about $5,000. And if you were to look at program capacity, because they're right in line, it's about the same. But if you'll take Weinkoff, for example, um, their per pupil expense based on their average daily membership um, appears to be a little high, 5,461. Um, but if you look across, you can see that they are not at capacity. You, they are not utilizing all of this program space. If we were to place more students in Weinkoff, you would see that, that per pupil expenditure go down. Um, you can see that over to the left, the 4,836, if we were maximizing the utilization of that, um, that, that school. So then if you look at the average, um, where generally um, it costs approximately $4,969 if you look at all of the elementary schools in the district. Um, and you can see how they align. So by maximizing our space utilization, um, Harrisburg is down to 4,136. Okay. The next slide is about personnel consolidation savings. So um, if we were to consolidate and close Beverly Hills, we could save approximately $534,000 a year. Um, that is a reoccurring savings. Um, those, that would increase every year because their salary and benefit increases each year. The only um, the footnote that I would say is that um, the state allocates one principal per school. So if we close the school, we would not get the allocation from the state. Um, so we would not get those dollars, but we would get all of the others. So um, in reality, instead of 534, it's probably more like 450 because the state actually would not allocate that state principal paid position because we would already have one, one per school. The Royal Oaks, Weinkoff, and other adjacent schools can absorb the, po the population of Beverly Hills at no additional cost. Um, and as you saw on the screen on the slide prior, if we utilize our space, then our per pupil expenses will be reduced. And as we say here, there's enough space in our current existing facilities without spending additional dollars. Okay. And in summary, uh, regarding student impact, the proposed closure of Beverly Hills will continue to provide students with all current program choice options, provide, with, pro provide them with more adequate facilities, classroom space, and accessibility for all students in relatively close proximity to the current enrollment areas. For the facility analysis, the excessive repair, renovation, replacement costs necessary to maintain the operation of a 65-year-old facility on a site with serious limitations or major considerations to recommend the closure of this facility. Financial, the closure of, closure of Beverly Hills Elementary will result in operational savings, lower per student cost, facility cost savings, and no adverse impact on transportation costs. Closing the school is significantly less costly than renovation, repair, or replacement. Based on the information from this study, the recommendation is to close Beverly Hills Elementary consistent with the 10-year plan approved by the Board of Education in February 2018. I, my only question is, you said there was no impact on transportation costs, but how could that be if it's further away from the other schools. For instance, it is further away, and I got my car and checked that mileage out. And I know from door to door, like from, from, from Royal Oak, I mean from R. McAllister to Beverly Hills, it was like three miles. From Beverly Hills to Royal Oaks, it was, it was five miles, so that's two miles, I mean, just from door to door. That's not taking any other route. That was just going straight. So that's two miles difference there. It was two miles difference further, just from, just from that point to that point. 
So it would have to be further diff, diff, and and besides the the congestion trying to get through all those and I mean that was bad to begin yeah, with. Yeah, Mrs. Carpenter. But what I'm wondering, there has to be a transportation difference. There's actually um on Mr. Shoemaker, do you want to mention he did yeah. the research on Ms. Carpenter, the I did a Google map search to last night just to confirm the distances and the there are two route two several routes to Royal Oaks from Beverly Hills and all of them are 3.3 miles um, so it's not five miles I don't know what route you happen to take I went straight down well, 29 going down 29 is 3.3 miles right to Dakota mm -hmm. Avenue in front of that school going straight from going straight from Beverly Hills to that school Bye. at Royal Oaks no, we're just talking distances. She yeah. was talking Mr. about Shoemaker. from Beverly Hills to... I yeah. need to caution the crowd. Thanks. We need to maintain protocol tonight. So uh, if you will, please not shout from the audience. If you have questions and you're signed up to be a speaker, you can certainly um, ask those then, and, and we'll try to get the answers for you. But uh, it's very important that you do not speak out tonight. Thank you. Uh, no. Let's have a general... Check it. Oops. I did. I have a general question. I can't hear you, Richard. Change, changing the surgery. Oh. Dr. Probst? I think it depends on the location where someone lives. There are sections of the Beverly Hills District that actually are not as long, Carolyn, as what you're discussing. But the cost of a two-mile difference is marginal. We're talking gas for two miles. It's very, very minimal. So it wouldn't, it, it would that, not impact our transportation question. budget. We can absorb it. We are driving much longer routes at other sites. That would not be an issue. And the fact that we don't have to buy additional school buses, which would have been the issue, is, is, is a good thing, too. So there's no, there would not be. Okay, yeah. that was my, yes, my question. Um, and I'd just like to ask a general question about the methodology of this report. Y'all are real smart people. You amaze me every day. I truly mean that sincerely. Um, but um, I believe Mr. Louder said a moment ago that some of the uh, uh, analysis was done in-house. Have you all done any kind of peer, uh, peer review type of thing, if that's appropriate, with other, I mean, historically from your own experience or, or uh, other school districts? Am I calling up a buddy across the line somewhere and saying, is my calculation making sense? I'm just trying to ask what your, uh, it, for me, from if I were doing my, what would be my sanity check about the methodology that you're doing? How have you confirmed objectively what you know in house? I guess it's the easiest way of answering we've, the question. We built three elementary schools in the past four years, and so we took all those elementary schools and looked at the components. Which it, that's all. We built three elementary schools in the past four years. We just received bids on the third one. That's the most up-to-date data you'll get as far as components within the school system. Took those components and utilized those as far as each type of trade and then pulled those in and filled in the form with real numbers from real square footage from the real bids. And that was transferred into this form work to be able to create the, the final. Now, as far as what other people do in the rest of the state, don't know, but this is what we've done in the last three we've built. So it was able to pull those numbers in directly into the form and utilize that historical cost associated with it. Okay. Board members, in the interest of time with our audience tonight um, and needing to get to the public hearing, um, we are not voting on anything tonight. Um, so uh, if you would gather your questions and send them to Carolyn and I uh, by Wednesday, evening if at all possible so staff has time to research answer your questions um, and you may have more questions after the public hearing as well tonight so like I said please take your notes and gather those uh, I would like to try to get through a couple of these action items that were required in some cases by law uh, to vote on things before the end of our fiscal year on uh, June 30th so are you all okay with moving forward okay um, 5.01, uh, Mr. Ben Allred, for the 2018-19 Early College uh, Memorandum of, of Agreement, I guess it is, A, uh, with Rowan Cabarrus Community College. 
just entertain any questions you have. Um, I highlighted some of the changes, had our attorneys look over that as well uh, in the special education department. But if you have questions, we'll take those now. Can you go over those changes, Ben? So if you'll look down in section, on just a second, uh, 9.4. Do you have that, Kelly? Okay, thank you. Um, it, it's primarily a restatement of how we serve students with 504 plans, um, ADA, and IEPs. Um, there's a crossover between how colleges serve students and how uh, public schools serve students, so this just more clearly articulates it. Uh, Mr. Schwartz can probably speak better to that. Madam Chair, we, we may need to um, suggest a revision to this, um, but uh, we're going to have to figure that out in communication with the other parties and uh, in our own staff. Is substantial revision or only to 9.4? Only to 9.4, um, minor revision. Potentially. We're gonna, we, need to, we need more information first. Okay, and you'll be able to finish that this week? Yes. So we have time to review whatever the additional changes are? Mm-hmm. And just for the public, Mr. Allward, can you um, just share what this agreement is for, which programs? Uh, sure. Uh, we have two uh, early colleges, the Cabarrus Early College of Technology and the Cabarrus Kannapolis Early College. Uh, each year we enter into a memorandum of agreement uh, which covers uh, facilities, instruction, community college courses, costs, uh, liaisons, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of information in there to make sure that um, the spaces that we use, the instruction that we get, and the money we spend is agreed upon between all the institutions. Okay. And just for the parents who are here, uh, if you're not familiar with this and you have a child nearing the end of middle school, perhaps uh, this is a great program or two programs to look at uh, where the children come out of uh, high school and college with an associate degree, uh, basically at no cost to you. So they've gone to two years of college uh, when they graduate. Are there any other changes, Ben? No. Uh, there were some small changes where a word was missed last year, uh, updates of dates. Uh, there was a removal of the board chair's actual name uh, just because board chairs tend to change in uh, years outside of the MOA. Uh, so unfortunately, I left Mr. Shoemaker's uh, email address in but took his name out. That will be changed. So um, other than 9.4, it's essentially the same agreement we approved yes, sir. last year. Okay. And that will go to the action agenda? So you can read it over uh, additionally this week if you like. Okay. Something uh, about PE or something? Did you say that? The change to PE, Carolyn, was the course that was used uh, changed title. So they had to change the title of the course in the MOA. Everyone can oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. 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 Next item is 5.02, the academic fees list with Mr. Alward again. Mm -hmm. Uh, so each year what we provide for you is uh, a running list of the fees over the previous five, six years as they build. So you can see the changes in fees uh, over time. Um, what Dr. Probst has pulled up right now is the description page. If you'll, can you scroll to the next page? Oh, I can do it. I have control two, don't I? Are there two documents in there? Or just, okay. Thank you. I thought you scroll one. Um, so there's two things that changed this year. One is uh, we added in the elementary school yearbook. That is not a new fee. Uh, elementary students have had the opportunity to buy a yearbook for years to be consistent with middle school and high school. We added that in. The fee that's there is not required. It's an optional fee, and it represents the maximum that any yearbook would be. Uh, same thing for uh, middle and high school. Uh, AP World History is not a new AP World uh, AP course, but it is new to our district over the last three years, and so uh, teachers requested that we add a fee uh, to purchase supplies in that class. But other than that, there have been no changes. Any questions, board members? I think we need to do it on action. Yes. Yeah. Okay, it'll be on the action agenda next week. I think you have a question. Um, I did. I just, again, were some. Of, is this every fee that every kid's? It covers everything, or what do we mean? There's got to well, be things that are These missing. fees uh, are consistent with board policy 4600, uh, which are fee academic fees. Academic fees. Ac okay. Academic fees, yes. Um, the board a few years ago requested that we include some additional things on there. So you'll see that the graduation cap and gown is on there, the transcript fee for alumni is on here, um, as well as the yearbooks, which are not required fees. Mm -hmm. um, what we ask anybody that does this is they have to 
if they have a fee and a classroom has to go through a school-based procedure uh, and then they have to request that to the board annually okay but like a marching band fee is not in here pardon me like marching band fees are not in here well, marching band is an extracurricular activity so, so we don't do include not, uh, athletics and things like that okay correct. so athletics and march and, and extracurricular fees are not in here like the robotics and that type of thing correct okay do we compile a list of those as well uh, we do not how do we ensure they're consistent pardon me how would then how do we ensure they're consistent across schools we can collect that if we need to but to date we've not been requested to okay yeah. and Thank I think you. different schools have different I'll say levels of participation in marching band or even in athletics cheerleading competitions or not all those are well, it, much be, it would be nice to know that we're consistent <laughs> and at least have a have a listing of those fees at some point not t tomorrow or whatever yeah that I don't think that would fall under Ben's area uh, well, whoever's area yeah. it is, we'd, I'd like to see that at some point. I'm not point. sure. I, I just misunderstood. Yeah. Did you say you would like the fees tomorrow? No. I would not okay. like to see the fees tomorrow. <laughs> I thought I heard tomorrow. No, sir. No, sir. Yeah. I don't need them tomorrow. I, okay. I just yeah. think it would be yeah. <clears throat> just being consistent. Yeah, yeah and they, they are not consistent. I know. No. I'll say back in the day. Is there, do we still have the cap on the band expense? Because I know at some point that was kind of getting out of control. So. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Allred? So we'll go to the 5.03 Career and Technical Education application for state and federal funding. Mr. Parker, welcome. Good evening. I saw the clock, so I know this will be probably my most abbreviated presentation ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will let you know I uploaded three documents for all of you to review um, the presentation for the evening which I'll, I'll cut short but also uh, the executive summary that explains what the local plan is about and also the dollar amounts that are included um, and also there is an, uh, a document that needs signatures from uh, Dr. Louder and also Ms. Furtenbaugh uh, which is actually the, the documentation that DPI needs me to keep track of that we are committed to, com to completing the plan. Um, I will for the sake of time skip down to some of these slides here. We're on the screen right there we go <coughs> I'm gonna skip a few here uh, the local planning system and what I've got on the screen here now is it's actually split into two parts and this is the what uh, the Department of Public Instruction requires us to to do is put together a plan for uh, performance and how we're going to improve uh, over the 1819 school year it's split into two parts the first one is the four-year strategic plan which um, I've made sure that it aligns with the district strategic plan so as you read through it you'll see a lot of references to that also part two is our performance indicators and how we're going to create strategies to improve those performance indicators um, I'm going to go ahead and skip the next two slides just briefly. There, the four, the four-year plan and also um, the performance indicators. Um, one thing, what I will say that you'll see is also a reference to third-party vendors. We're still partnering with National Academy Foundation for our academies. So as you look through the uh, the plan, you'll see that reference in there. The next slide is CTE enrollment. We are increasing uh, in CTE. So this year, our enrollment is 12,028 students. Uh, that continues to increase. A few of the success stories that we've had this year is we're re actually uh, refreshing computers we, uh, around the district. This year's full refresh was at Jam Robinson. Uh, the coming school year we're planning for Cox Mill. Uh, and we're also refreshing a lot of the kitchen equipment. A lot of the uh, su supplies and, uh, that we have in a lot of our kitchens are out of date. Uh, and also um, there are some of them that just need to be replaced completely. So we're taking them out and totally refreshing them. Uh, we also began a partnership with Constructive Learning Design, which is providing professional development for our leadership team and also our teachers. So we'll continue that. Um, that it's actually on instructional coaching. We'll continue those sessions for 18 years. Uh, this is the slide that I wanted to get to real quick was the new programs that we're starting in 1819 for the family consumer science program we're bringing in a uh, third party vendor curriculum called ProStart uh, the ProStart curriculum is an industry credential basically uh, it, the whole curriculum is built around an industry credential and what we want to do is to increase enrollment in the hospitality and tourism cluster so that course actually fits within that cluster so that we can increase that amount of concentrators in that area uh, the other one is a course called Principles of Biomedical Science, and it's part of Project Lead the Way. If you've heard of Project Lead the Way, they are a third-party vendor that provides engineering and health sciences curriculum. Uh, we're bringing them in just for the academy at Northwest Cabarrus, and that, that course is actually for freshmen. So freshmen in 1819 will start that course. 
We're also looking at how we can bring in more industry credentials and make them replace some of our post assessments. Right now in CTE, every single course has to have a post assessment tied to it. So the Department of Public Instruction is encouraging us to look at how we tie those credentials and certifications in place of the post assessment. So you'll see some of that happen in the next school year. Um, one of the things you'll read if you if you read through our local plan online is a tremendously huge amount of rec, uh, references to special population students. Um, the federal Perkins legislation is constantly speaking about special population students. And so what we've done in our district for the coming year is realign the position so that we will have a special populations coordinator. They will be the liaison between the EC department and the ESL department, also working with students that are in non-traditional coursework. So you'll see that come on in 1819. One of the things that we've talked about just about every time I'm up here is work-based learning. So I'm going to realign this for the coming school year, the academy coordinator positions that we have, there'll be four of them. They're going to be sharing a high school to work for all the academies in the district, and then their title will change to work-based learning coordinator. They will be the go-to person for anything to do with uh, apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, job shadowing, or internship opportunities. So that will be one thing that changes in the 18-19 year. The big piece of the puzzle also is the career development coordinator position. Uh, we're going to be changing that title to career and technical education coordinator. And what they're going to do is not just be working with students and student um, and career development opportunities, but also they're going to be the instructional coach for all the CTE teachers that are in our department. So we've been providing instructional coaching training for all of them this current school year and we'll continue that into the new school year. And then they will become the instructional coach for all of the CTE teachers. There are a lot of slides on here about performance, and I'm going to skip them. It's I'm great information. It's great information, but I'm going to skip them for the sake of time. The one that I was going to get to is the 3S1 and 4S1. These are the ones about graduation cohorts, and um, as you can see, we are at 99%. Um, we can still get a little bit better. I, I'm envious there were some that hit 100 on this next slide. So I know we had Forsyth and Guilford, they hit 100, and even Gaston hit 100. So I've got a little bit of room to improve. So what, what is a 3S1 and a 4S1? 3S1 is students that graduated, all the students that graduated. 4S1 is the cohort graduation rate. So that's the differentiation between the two. But for us, they're both the same. They're both at 99%. And this so, is for Mr. all students. Mr. Parker, if I may, I believe that shows, Rob, that if students are engaged in the pathway of a CTE pathway, that they are more likely to graduate as opposed to maybe just taking the minimum courses they needed to take you know, to meet their 28 hours, 32 hours, whatever. So. That is correct. Uh, we have eight performance indicators, and the one that's called technical attainment, it's 2S1 on the slides. That's the one that's every single student that takes a CTE course, that's the one that they, that's their post-assessment scores. But all of the other ones are based on concentrator status. So the ones that you see on here, these are the students that actually graduated with a four-course CTE concentration. So CTE keeps kids in school. That's our mantra. Let me skip a few of these down to this part. Um, for our budget for this year, we actually had an increase of 36 months of employment from the state. Also, our uh, PRC 14 state funds increased 17000 almost $18,000. Um, the budget that was built uh, for today was actually on the current school year's uh, PRC 17 federal budget because we had not received those amounts yet. Um, actually, they came in today, which so I have not been able to update the PowerPoint, which was uh, an increase of roughly $30,000. What I'll do is uh, resubmit the cover sheet to Eileen. That way, all of you have a copy of that, and you'll, you'll see the actual amount for 17. Mr. Parker? Yes. How do you, how does the state support uh, your budget increase by 17.6? How did that, is that just because of our growth as a system? Is yes, that, sir, it is. You know, that was, that was, so as long as we grow, then that budget will increase according to what we it grow. It is. A lot of the CTE budgets are built on a, a formula that includes poverty and also um, just growth within that, that region or that community. And so for us, um, you can see Cabarrus County is growing by leaps and bounds. I found out that in our region there was only three school districts that received an increase. It was us, Charlotte, Meck, and Kannapolis City. So it's very obvious where the growth is. So that's why those numbers went up. Um, the last slide is really the, the link to this presentation and also to um, our LPS. So if you want to read through it, the username and password is guest, guest, and it's wide open so you can see exactly what I created. So real creative on that username and password. <laughs> that was a very fast presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be performing at the Ed Center all week long. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Yeah, thank you. Okay, board members, we are done with our, I'll say, our traditional work session agenda. So is that an action item or a consent item?
I'm sorry? Is that an action or a consent item? Those are all consent. So I'm sorry, action, action. Action. Okay. Yeah. That whole section was action. Um, okay, at this time, I would like to take a five minute recess um, so that uh, when we get the final list, I see that's coming in now of people um, who are signed up and give us an opportunity just to get up and stretch for a moment uh, because. Uh, we have not only pub public hearing, which many of you are here for, but then we have a fair amount of topics after that in closed session as well. So we have a, quite a long evening ahead of us yet. So we will be back. It is 6.39, let's say 6.45. Thank you. Good evening. This is the June 4th uh, Board of Education work session and public hearing. We are back from recess and ready to begin the public hearing. Board members, I'll take a motion that the public hearing on the proposed closing of Beverly Hills Elementary School be opened to public input. Second. Mr. Walter made the motion, and that was, who made it? Mr. Harrison made the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, seven open. Oh, and the public hearing is now open. Uh, we'll have our first speaker. I believe it's uh, Sharon Fouts Burpo. Pardon me? Shannon, yes. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Just for kind of the rules in the road, so bear with me a second mm -hmm. here. Um, speakers will be called by the board chair to approach the podium to address the board regarding the proposed closing of Beverly Hills Elementary School in the order in which they signed up to speak. Individuals may speak for three minutes and persons speaking on behalf of a group, and the group had to be pre-designated uh, when you signed up, may speak for five minutes. Groups must select one speaker to represent them. Speakers may address the board only one time in one capacity. So there is a clock that we can see here, and you'll, Mr. Basilis, I guess, is telling folks about that. It will beep to give you the warning, and then when your three minutes is up, we'll move to the next speaker. So you may proceed. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. As we continue the conversation started eight months ago, I ask that you all go back and revisit the various hearings and correspondence regarding the closure of Beverly Hills. To paraphrase some of you from over the years, one of the most important things is the history and the community. When it means a lot to the neighborhood and community. Removing that school would be like ripping the heart out of the community. Now imagine you'd said those things about Beverly Hills. In 2014, it seems you are much more willing to think outside the box. With dozens of modular units across the county, from Cox Mill to Weinkauf, and exploding growth straining capacity, you've built a second school in the Odell community for grades three to five, leaving K-2 students in the older building nearly two miles away. While this configuration is not unheard of, it is unusual, as was noted by former chairman Blake Kiger in a 2014 Tribune article. Tonight, I'd like to propose more out-of-the-box thinking. Some ideas might include making Royal Oaks a K-8 school. This would allow you to discern if there is enough countywide interest to put fine arts in a high school over the next three to four years, creating a completed pipeline for the children currently excelling in the program. Rebuild Beverly Hills on site with multiple stories using a smaller footprint, yet yielding a higher capacity. Renovate the three neighborhood schools and use two for grades K-2 and the other for 3-5. This would allow each respective neighborhood to maintain its historic community charm, preserve seats for the phasing in of the state-mandated class size restrictions, and promote further collaboration within the communities. Given the county manager's proposed two-cent property tax increase, it seems fiscally responsible to consider the possible negative impact on funding when removing amenities such as walkable schools. In the same Tribune article referenced earlier, former board member Lynn Shu said, when you're looking at several thousand homes and parents, to have four or five complaints or concerns is not too bad. Conversely, when you're looking at several hundred homes and parents, to have thousands of complaints or concerns is at minimum reason to pause. We have heard from some of you that you're opposed to the closure of Beverly Hills. I'm urging you to stand up. Stand up for our community. Stand up for our school. Stand up for the taxpayers who faithfully paid for decades to fund new schools across the county. 
honor the communities who asked to be respected and invested in as they've invested in others over the years. Cherish our county's diversity from the large, new, and growing areas to the historic and established and embrace what that diversity has to offer current and prospective residents and their children. I am again asking you to save our school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. The next speaker is Dr. Amanda Cook, and she is speaking on behalf of the Physicians in Support of Beverly Hills. Welcome, Dr. Cook. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity tonight, and I want to thank you also for your service. I am here tonight as a mother of three daughters that currently attend Beverly Hills STEM School. I'm here as a professional in a STEM career, and I'm here as a pediatric specialist, and I serve the children of Cabarrus County. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, STEM occupations are growing at 17 percent, while other occupations are growing at less than 10 percent. STEM degree holders have a higher income than non-STEM careers. STEM workers play a key role in the sustained growth and stability of the U.S. economy. STEM education creates critical thinkers, increases science literacy, enables the next generation of innovators. This innovation in science literacy depends on a solid knowledge base in the STEM areas. Most jobs of the future will require a basic understanding of math and science. By exposing students to STEM and giving them opportunities to explore STEM-related concepts, they will develop a passion for it and be more likely to pursue a STEM career. STEM education helps to bridge the ethnic and gender gaps sometimes found in math and science fields. Initiatives have been established to increase the roles of women and minorities in STEM-related fields. STEM education breaks the traditional gender roles. STEM education is critical to help the United States remain a world leader. If you close Beverly Hills STEM School, then our STEM option becomes Weinkauf Elementary. Weinkauf Elementary already has more than 800 children enrolled. We have been told that there will be a capacity at Weinkauf for an additional 135 children. Those 135 seats will be filled by not only the kindergartners that live in that district, but also the Spanish Immersion Program. Most likely, there will be less than 100 STEM seats at Weinkauf for our student body at Beverly Hills, which is currently 414 children. If you close Beverly Hills STEM School, there will not be enough STEM seats for um, the children in our program that are interested. Many of the elementary schools in Cabarrus County have outgrown their building and have expanded into trailers. Why would you close a brick and mortar school building like Beverly Hills and place even more children into trailers? I'm sure the answer is because that's the cheaper thing to do, but at what cost? Not only are the children and educators in trailers exposed to elements, but in this day and age, it is simply not safe. It is challenging enough to maintain security of a real building, but a series of trailers is nearly impossible for staff and resource officers to keep safe from a catastrophic tragedy. While as a society we may heatedly debate the best prevention of school shootings, I think we can agree that these heinous crimes are most, mostly committed by people who do not value human life. They do not value their own human life and they do not value the lives of others. Teaching the value of human life starts at home, and it starts with us as parents. But our school-age children spend most of their waking hours in school. Therefore, the school shares in this responsibility. Children need to feel a sense of belonging to their school community. They need to feel that they are known and that they matter, as opposed to being members of just some nameless herd in a very large school. Elementary children range in age from 4 to 12 years of age. The human element in small schools is critical to healthy development. I believe that closing small neighborhood <coughs> schools like Beverly Hills can have very negative ramifications for the public health of the children in Cabarrus County. There is 40 years of data that indicate students in smaller schools have higher attendance. They have fewer dropouts. There's fewer incidences of disciplinary action and violence. There are higher levels of extracurricular participation in smaller schools and more parental involvement. Children with shorter commutes to school have more time available for after school studies, physical activity, and a good night's sleep. Children are the most vulnerable of our society. 
I request that you advocate for our children and vote to keep Beverly Hills STEM school open. I appreciate your attention tonight. <laughs> Mr. Jim Fulton. Mr. Jim Fulton. Good evening. Um, uh, good evening. Um, good evening to the superintendent and members of the board. Thank you very much for listening to us tonight. Um, uh, <clears throat> my name is Jim Fulton. I'm a McAllister parent, and I oppose the closing of Beverly Hills. Um, I, I, first, I, I want to be clear that I seriously disagree with just about everything said tonight about the process that got us here, the cost of renovation versus replacement, and the staff recommendation to close the school. But I'm taking the high road and trusting in your deliberation and judgment, fair-mindedness with what I'm about to, um, for what I'm about to say. Um, we chose uh, where to live, as is the case with many families, because of the character of our schools. And I don't mean the ranking of academic performance, but their diversity, their small size, their location, and their importance to the community. Our kids travel to school on roads they know well, <clears throat> excuse me, through neighborhoods they are familiar with and past houses of friends, teachers, and administrators they see every day. The importance of the school is reinforced to our children through former students who return as teachers, <clears throat> through parents who were students in return so their children could enjoy the same positive educational experience they had and through neighbors whose grown children attended the school and who may someday want to return. Because our schools are small, teachers, administrators, students, and their families know each other, which improves communication, understanding, <clears throat> safety, security, and most of all fosters a sense of community and belonging in our children. The <clears throat> proximity and accessibility of the school to the community facilitates parental involvement student and, in student education, which is one of the most important indicators of academic success, especially at the primary level. Small school size has um, likewise been shown to provide substantial academic benefit, especially to children at risk. In previous meetings, you've heard civic leaders describe in detail the significance of these schools to our community, the void that would be left if they are closed, and the trust placed in the stewardship of the county when these schools were turned over to you. Do not think that closing our schools and sending our children elsewhere is a neutral proposition just so long as they have a seat in a classroom. In all of the discussions around the closings and redistricting of our schools, I've never heard that they don't work. They are in stable communities. They are diverse. Parents and students know and love them. The community is involved and supports them. Former students return to teach in them. <clears throat> they are exactly the kind of schools that we should be trying to keep open. And that is why I'm asking that these schools be left open, renovated or replaced in kind, and returned to us. And I think the issue simply comes down to one of fairness and choice. Every generation pays forward for the next. Our schools were built by, a, by an established community as a gesture and faith of hope and a, and a demonstration of civic responsibility. And we have the same obligation to communities that are springing up in undeveloped areas of the county. The problem is that while we're being asked to supply other people's choice to live out in the county, to pay for their schools, for their police, their fire protection, and maintain all of their infrastructure, we're also expected to give up our schools and to have our choice to live in a walkable community with small schools taken away. And that's just fundamentally unfair. Okay, we have more you, than Mr. paid Cole. for our schools. And I just think that they should be returned to us for us and for our future generations to enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Brenda Rackle. Good evening. Good evening. And you have five minutes as you're speaking for the PTO. Okay, thank you. Decrepit and a car running on 100,000 mile tires. You all are the only ones who have a problem with our school. Our PTO raised $23,370 this year. We spent $18,400 supporting our teachers, students, and staff, and the year isn't over yet. Beverly Hill STEM participated in the City Nature Challenge and submitted 567 scientific observations. Our students helped Cabarrus County place 16th in the world. Beverly Hills participated in the North Carolina Science Olympiad. Our students placed first, second, or third in six individual events. Our STEM teachers have been implementing the project 
they designed and materials they purchased after being awarded a $45,000 Jimmy Johnson grant. We had students advance to the regional and state science fair. Beverly Hills STEM Elementary was the proud winner of the Air Hugo Dunk Show, a program of the Charlotte Hornets, which is awarded to one school in the Charlotte region. Beverly Hills was the proud winner for logging the most hours reading. Our school, our school and playground does have ADA access. It is not easy, but we make it happen. Are we being punished for doing more with less? It has been very interesting to me as I read about school closures. I only find examples of closures in communities that no one cares about. Closures in communities with dwindling populations and poor achievement, that is not Beverly Hills. We are filled to capacity, our community is growing, we have a perfectly diverse student body, people are moving into the neighborhood, not out. The city of Concord is investing a community center in our neighborhood. The Greenway is extending into our backyard. Everything I read about communities with school closure is the opposite of Beverly Hills. Our Board of Education has to hold this administration to a high burden of proof. Have they proven to you, beyond all reasonable doubt, that there is an educational benefit to moving our children out of their neighborhood? Your answer to that question in the past has been no. You built Bethel Elementary in the community. Mount Pleasant schools were rebuilt in the community, keeping their children at home. Harrisburg, Royal Oaks, and Odell, again, keeping their children in the community. We request the same thing. Our tax dollars have supported growth all over the county. We happily supported it. We continue to pay for other schools, but are asked to give up our own. One school every 70 years. That is all we ask. One <laughs> adequate, energy efficient building. The infrastructure is in place. It's a great community. You might even bring some charter school families back into the system. The Board of Education has a history of doing the right thing. Our Performance Learning Center is a brand new facility for about 125 students because it did the right thing for the kids that needed it. The Opportunity School operates for the same reason. The Early College, another example, expensive programs that support a small number of children. You support the IB program at an annual expense for elementary, middle, and high school. Every program has recurring fees every year, and every five years, there's a fee for reevaluation. This year, there will be about 45 graduates, and less will receive a diploma. My point is, these are small programs supported by a school district at an expense. You have set the precedent to do the right thing for children in this community when they needed it and where they needed it. It might get a little messy. It will be challenging. It will be time consuming. It may be expensive. But it's the, it is the right time and it is the right place. It will be worth it to the children and families who call this community their home. Thank you. Laura Schumann. Good evening. Thank you to the Board of Education for giving the community another opportunity to discuss the needs of our school system, which includes the future of Beverly Hills Elementary School. For this discussion, I personally wear a variety of hats. I'm a citizen of the Beverly Hills community. I am a taxpayer and an avid voter. But most importantly, I'm a parent advocate who values education for all of our children within our great community. Please do not close Beverly Hills Elementary School. We've heard that Beverly Hills is old. I think the administration uses words like decrepit and beyond its useful life to describe the current state. I think we first need to ask ourselves how we got to the point where one of our facilities is described as decrepit by the very people tasked with taking care of it. 
We understand that at various times in the past several years, other projects in the county needed attention, and that was fine with the Beverly Hills District. Funds that could have been used to maintain Beverly Hills were needed elsewhere that for projects that were deemed more pressing at the time. And you know what? We in the Beverly Hills community supported that and we never complained. We value and support education all over the county and not just in our own backyard. And if children in other areas of the county have a more demanding need for facilities, we supported it. When the decision was made that the old Royal Oaks facility needed attention and a bond referendum was added to our ballots, we supported it. We voted for it. We were glad that that community and that school were going to be shown some love because we knew that one day our patients would pay off and when it was our turn, our school would also be shown some love. I can tell you that this current discussion is not really what we had in mind. Instead of showing love to Beverly Hills, we are being shown the door. We have supported education throughout the county with our time, our talents, and our taxes, which makes us like shareholders in the school system, and the dividend is the education we get for our children. Closing our school will make us second guess our past feelings of support and our actions of solidarity. But let's go back to the old building. You know what? A lot of buildings are old, and they're still cherished, protected, and utilized. For example, there's a building called Old East on the campus of my alma mater, the University of North Carolina. It is the oldest state university building in the nation, and except for during two short periods of renovation in the early 20s and in the early 90s, it has been in constant use for more than two centuries and is still in use today. Please work with us to preserve this wonderful treasure today and for future students. I thank you all for your service to our community and for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have Julia Schumann. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Julia Schumann, and I would like to thank the board members um, for your time this evening as we discuss the very important topic of Beverly Hills Elementary School. I appreciate all the hard work that you do to make sure that the students all around Cabarrus County have access to a high quality education. I am a graduate of Beverly Hills and I am now finishing the seventh grade at Concord Middle School. I loved Beverly Hills when I was there, but now, I'm, now that I am in middle school, I love and appreciate Beverly Hills even more. Do you know why? Well, I realize now that Beverly Hills gave me the foundation I need to embrace and love learning and respect learning. I, lo I learned to love school and gain the sense of personal responsibility regarding my role in education. I hope that you ask, I hope that if you ask my middle school teachers, they would tell you that I was well prepared for middle school and beyond. Thanks to my time at Beverly Hills. Many days at Beverly Hills, I walked to and from school. When my little sister started school there, we walked together. My little brother is starting kindergarten there in August, and I'm excited that he and my sister will continue the tradition of walking to our neighborhood school. Please don't take that away from them and others. I'm sure that the other elementary schools in Cabarrus County are great too, but we think our school is very special, and we hope that you do as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Julia. And next we have Anna Maria Schumann. Anna Maria. Anna Maria. Thank you. Hello. My name is Ani Schumann, and I am a third grader at Beverly Hills Elementary School. I want to thank the members of the Board of Education for allowing me to come back and talk to you again about my awesome school. When I came and spoke to you last time, I was scared. I was nervous to get in front of the board and all the people in the room. I worried you would not like me. I was scared about what you would think about what I had to say about Beverly Hills. But I, know, <clears throat> but I knew in my gut that it was the right thing to do. So I took a deep breath, pushed all those scared feelings down, and came and spoke to you. And you know what? I felt so much better after I did it. I was proud of myself for standing up for my school, and so, were my, and so was my family. And you were all very nice to me. I am glad that I did not miss the opportunity of doing something great. 
My dad always tells me that when there's something wrong about a situation, you will know in your gut. Your gut will tell you when something is right or wrong. Right now, you may also be feeling scared or nervous or anxious because you have a very big decision to make about my school. You may worry about what people will think. You may worry about the money it will take to keep Beverly Hills open. But if you listen to your gut, you will do the right thing. Keeping Beverly Hills open is the right thing to do. You'll also be glad that you did it and not miss the opportunity of doing something great. And your gut will agree. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna Maria. We appreciate hearing from the students. And yes, we all have that nod in our gut right now. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have Mr. Lee Schumann. Nothing like getting upstaged by my whole family, is there? It's probably going to be the worst speech of them all, but I had a speech planned actually tonight for everybody, and I'll probably just end up emailing it to you, but I'm scrapping it. Um, after the presentation that was given tonight that I have been asking for for several days that uh, I didn't receive until 10 minutes before I got in here, um, can't help but have to respond to some of the information that's in that. I'll spend the next week doing the same, but these are some really important points to understand. First and foremost, um, it was great to see the presentation. Um, I'm wondering why that presentation wasn't made a year ago. I'm wondering why that presentation wasn't made back when Royal Oaks was discussed as a possible consolidation with Beverly Hills. It would have been an appropriate time to have that discussion and have the data so that you could understand what it is that you were voting on when you voted for Royal Oaks to be the size that it was. Um, why are there no repairs um, done to Beverly Hills and why do we have a $10.5 million deferred maintenance budget. Well, I think my wife talked about that somewhat here, but that um, is cost that hasn't been spent at this school over the past two decades. Uh, if welfare is so important as the general statutes say it is, and as we talk about in this presentation, uh, it seems to me that we would have paid some attention to make the school safer the past two decades. Um, at this point, it's demolition by neglect, and in my opinion, it's dereliction of duty. If you don't do those things and you provide an unsafe environment for children, it's not appropriate. It's certainly not appropriate then to turn around and use that against that community as for why their school can't be replaced. Secondly, the transportation costs. There were a lot of discussion earlier about that. The transportation costs are real simple, guys. It's not that hard to understand, okay? We have six buses at Beverly Hills, six. Four of them line up before any students or parents get into the line to allow their students to get out of the car. Four of those buses don't come in contact with any uh, cars that come into our school parking lot. So there are two buses in 45 minutes that have to make their way through a few cars in traffic. Because of the size of that school, there is not an issue with the bus and the school traffic. Secondly, those six buses are fairly full. Those six buses only represent less, they rep represent less than half of the current population at Beverly Hills. 3.4 miles is one thing to understand. It's an over 10 minute drive. In some cases, it's a 15 minute drive. On rush hour traffic at eight o'clock in the morning, I just would ask you to drive that distance. It's not about the mileage, it's about the time. If there are more kids that are gonna be riding buses, which I can guarantee there will be if their parents have to drive an extra 15 minutes in the opposite direction, there's gonna be more kids from Beverly Hills riding buses if they go to Royal Oaks, okay? If you have to maintain the bus ride time, there's going to be less students on those buses. There is only one way to do that. That's more buses, which is more gas, more maintenance, more bus drivers, and more insurance. That's the simple fact. I had this great speech plan. I was going to, you know, uh, talk about this great movie, uh, A Few Good Men. You've probably seen it. And there's that great scene where Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. Well, you know what? We can handle the truth. I don't know that there's some people here that can't. But the truth is that this school's been neglected. The truth is we've been paying taxes for two decades, and all we require is a new school every 70 years. There aren't new roads to be built in Beverly Hills. There aren't, isn't new infrastructure. There isn't new police stations or fire stations. We have gladly paid those taxes. We will gladly pay the tax increase. We will not have a single complaint for, us, for any money in our, in our neighborhood. But to pay those taxes and then be asked to give up the soul of our community, what we've been built around for 60 years, unacceptable. Royal Oaks, 
Um, I like the fact that North Carolina Journal Statutes was listed in the presentation earlier. That North Carolina Journal Statute was sent by our group after the last round that we had here. We talked about North Carolina Journal Statutes because they weren't followed. Okay? When Royal Oaks was replaced, there was not a feasibility study done. I can send around the Fanning Howey report again. Royal Oaks was graded. It was not in the summary pages, but it was graded. And it was not shown to be replaced. Beverly Hills was shown to be replaced. Now, the decision had already been made to replace Royal Oaks at that point in time. But there should have been a feasibility study done for Royal Oaks, and there was not. That's a problem. The only reason why there's a feasibility study now for Beverly Hills is because we've asked for it. Now, you tell me how in the world we're supposed to sit here today and have this conversation a year and a half after the last fight that we had and since two years since Royal Oaks has been done, the decision has been made, and have us accept the fact that we're just asking for too much. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chief. <laughs> Mr. Rod Richardson. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Sergeant Rod Richardson. This is not about your expensive, shiny new school, but that doesn't matter to you. This is about the students of Beverly Hills Elementary. This is about the neighborhood around Beverly Hills Elementary and the negative impact it has. But that doesn't matter to you. This is about the people, the parents, the taxpayers living in those neighborhoods and the impact it has on their homes, their businesses, and their lives. But that doesn't matter to you. All that matters to you is that shiny new building out on Dakota Street that no parent in Concord wants to send their child to and the money you spent for that boondoggle. This is a, there, there's one other factor you haven't looked into, one of their costs, and that's each and every one of you can be replaced with a new school board. Ms. Laura, is it? Guerrero. Guerrero, thank Guerrero. you. I'm not Italian, my husband is, so. Hi, Good I'm evening. Laura Guerrero. I'm a Beverly Hills community member. As of Thursday, I will have no children left at Beverly Hills. Um, it's been difficult deciding what to say tonight. Um, numbers and data can be manipulated to make any point feasible, so I'm going to leave all the numbers to other people. Um, I'm just going to ask you as elected officials to ask some questions like, why is Beverly Hills School not included in the student realignment study? If the administration is so confident that the school has run its course and is no longer needed, why not leave it in the discussion for the independent experts to determine? My tax dollars are paying for the study, and yet my school is not even listed as an option when a decision has yet to be made. That seems corrupt. The student realignment study is showing that the next projected growth in our county is actually our Beverly Hills community, downtown Concord, and even Royal Oaks. So I challenge you to think ahead. Use a little forward planning. The fluid 10-year plan seems frozen when discussing Beverly Hills, so maybe that should be revisited. Growth is coming to our area, so having the seats available makes sense, not to mention the legislation is not going anywhere. In my neighborhood, we have had three homes sell in the last eight months, and all of them to families with young children. Um, one of them even came from the Northwest School District. Um, we are witnessing the beginning of that transition to growth that the demographers forecasted. Even after losing our magnet status for next year, we are still looking at over 400 students at Beverly Hills. Concord is the 10th largest city in North Carolina. We've all heard this. So why are we closing schools? That doesn't make any sense. Bethel, Mount Pleasant, Odell, Royal Oaks, those historic communities all got to keep schools in their areas. My tax dollars were used on all of those new schools, and I'm glad for it. Without our tax dollars from our side of town, you would not have been able to build those schools. Yet, now you are asking me to give up my historic community's school. Last fall, Mr. Shoemaker told my neighbor that we just live on the wrong side of town. I find that disrespectful and indefensible as one of your constituents. 
We love our side of town and we pay taxes just like everyone else. We should be treated fairly and our community should not be disregarded. No school has been closed in recent memory. The last was in the 70s and that community has never recovered. You have Beverly Hills community's attention. Do not let close, do not close Beverly Hills. Do not let that be your legacy. It cannot be undone. What is the rush? We are a growing community in a thriving county. I urge you to do the right thing and keep this community's school open. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, could you, could you tell me your name, please? Because we thought somebody was going to be late. Oh, okay, I'm Kathy Sellers Moroney. Okay, so you are here on time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And that was the first line of my speech. I am Kathy Sellers Moroney, <laughs> and my address is 577 Ambergate Place, Northwest Concord, North Carolina, 28027. I have two rising eighth graders at JN Freeze. Also, I am serving on the student realignment study, um, which first met on May 9th, 2018. I was confused and concerned when I read the background report that kicked off the study. The background report said the realignment would be based on four projects to be completed. New West Cabarrus High School, New Hickory Ridge Elementary School. Three, adhere to a 10-year capital plan, specifically the discontinued use of Beverly Hills Elementary School starting 2019. And four, replace and expand R. Brown McAllister Elementary School with a capacity of 600 to 800, effective 2020. Wait, what? Based on the projects to be completed, I thought the final decision to close Beverly Hills Elementary was postponed. What about Coulter and Webb? When was this decided? What happened is that Superintendent Lauder's staff recommendation to close Beverly Hills and the 10-year capital plan became the starting point for the $150,000 study with Cropper GIS. So I asked the consultants, what would happen if there was a vote to keep Beverly Hills open? The consultant said they would readjust their findings at that time and we would proceed from there. And I said, well, the train has already left the station. A readjustment is highly unlikely. There was an article in 2002 entitled Dollars and Cents, The Cost Effectiveness of Small Schools. Their conclusion speaks directly to our situation. And I have a reference at the end. Many people know intuitively that small schools work best for children and teachers, but now there is research to prove it. Unfortunately, many communities have already lost their good small schools because they could not argue successfully against educators and policymakers determined to implement economies of scale through consolidation. Now it is clear that there are significant diseconomies in large facilities and that they do not create the best schools in which to nurture or educate children. It is important to preserve good small schools and limit school size. Best of all, this report indicates that creating facilities for small schools can be done cost effectively, and that, in fact, the cost of the large schools is higher considering their negative outcomes. I respect the hard work that you as the Board of Education does. I ask for three things. One, do not close Beverly Hills. Two. Fund a third party research study that looks at the true cost to renovate Beverly Hills. Three, please redirect Cropper GIS consultants to include Beverly Hills in the realignment study. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, number 12 speaker canceled, so we'll have number 13. And Heather, is it Niemer or Nimer? Niemer. Niemer. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I am Heather Niemer. Um, I am opposed to closing Beverly Hills. I've been a resident of Concord my whole life. I live here. I work here. Pay taxes and vote here. I believe everyone in this room would agree that when we fill out those ballots, we are doing so hoping that the person we are voting for really has the best interest of our city, communities, and families at heart. We elected you because we felt that you could do that. I realize that you have financial responsibilities, but there is a bigger picture. 
Is there not also a responsibility to us, the citizens, who have lived here and paid our taxes, that have gone to fund these new schools and support the growth in our neighboring districts, all the while you let our school rack up all of this deferred maintenance that is now thrown in our face? We deserve to have our school maintained also. You agreed to pay this firm $150,000 to complete a realignment study, but you told them to consider Beverly Hills to be discontinued. Since there has not yet been a vote to determine this, can you honestly say that that was fair? <coughs> Beverly Hills is a long way from decrepit, years away from the end of its life cycle. Just look at some of the other buildings in Concord. The old courthouse, for example, was, was built in 1876 and it's not fallen in yet. <laughs> a little TLC can go a long way. Just because it's older does not mean that there's not a place for it in today's time. Beverly Hills community thrives because of our neighborhood school. Cabarrus County School Administration is not looking, for the, looking out for the best interest of our community with the recommendation to close our beloved Beverly Hills. Tonight, I urge you, the board members, please do what's right. Make the right decision. Be the voice for the people that voted you into your current position, and please vote to keep Beverly Hills open. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have Karen Miller. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Miller. I live on Circle Drive right behind Beverly Hills School. When the leaves fall, I can see the school. Um, both my children who are grown went to Beverly Hills. My uh, son actually rode his bike. Uh, my daughter walked with her friends. Uh, my grandson who lives with me uh, is looking forward to riding his bike to school. Uh, just be a real shame to take that away from our community. A lot of the kids like to walk. A lot of the parents walk their children. You don't get that in big schools. You don't get the personal touch like you do at Beverly Hills, where it's not just great teachers, decent building, good food, but you get the parents. You get all these people behind us. We like our community like it is. We like new neighbors moving in with children. There's two houses beside me for sale. They went up the same day. It's a contest to see which one goes first. But both of those houses have got families with children looking there. The same reason we live here in this community. I'm not from Concord, but my husband was a ravenous Concord person. His name was Lee Miller, and he loved this community he was on the everything you can think of, all these committees. committees. He uh, promoted Cabarrus County with uh, the chamber. He made me understand what it is to be in a community, what it means to, to know these people when you see them in the store, or to be able to ask them how their family members are, know the teachers, know their families, cheer for everybody at the high school, because you see them from elementary, daycare even, all the way through. So what you're doing is you're tearing a community apart. It's not about a building, it's about a community. All these people said the right things. The feasibility study, that you all didn't tell us enough stuff. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves for some of the stuff you've done to us and some of the stuff you've put us through. But our children come first and I, in my heart, feel like you've already got your decision made, which pisses me off. But I tell you what, we're watching out for you people because you're breaking up our community and you don't break up Beverly Hills. Okay, so we'll go to speaker 17. Jay Meza, welcome. Uh, he just indicated they're not here to remove them. Hello. Um, good evening, Mr. Superintendent and all others. Um, yes, we're back again. And no, we're not leaving, especially me. 
Um, I am Jay Meza, and yes, I went to Beverly Hills Elementary School. I'm graduating from Jane Freeze this week and going to high school. This school is where people took chances on me. They take chances on everyone, and they're not regretting it. They took a chance, and I'm heading in a STEM path, most likely going to Northwest. So Beverly Hills prepared with that. They planted roots that they're still there. Um, I'm here representing the kids and the Latino community. Uh, the kids because I have the mentality of one. I would like to point out something really quick. Okay. We're like the kids in the family that sometimes like never ask for anything, you know? Um, and then when we want something, you know, we can't get it. Like, like really? Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, so at this point, when we want something, we can't get it. Uh, we've been in touch for so long, and now what? We ask for a simple thing, and that's to keep this school. This is an extraordinary school. When we accept someone, we keep them in a bond, and this bond can't be broken. We fight as one, we stand as one, we go down as one, and we stay as one. This bond is stronger than a lot of things. A lot of things. Um, you can't break this bond. Period. Why be punishing us for doing more with less? We're extra packed and even more people are coming soon and soon. Just like half a year ago, a couple moved right next to us. Pointing something out here. Um, let us keep this school. It's something simple. It's as simple as asking for like a potato chip. <laughs> um, we're going to win somehow. We're going to take this victory royale for the boys and girls of Beverly Hills. Thank you. We have Mrs. D. Davis. Hi. First, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity tonight in support of neighborhood schools. Doing the right thing is what we, mu we want our children to learn. It is what we want our leaders to do, and it is what good leaders choose to do. Adults are the examples children follow. You, as elected an elected school board, led by a school superintendent, have very important choices to make. Gannott says that children are like wet cement. What falls on them sticks. Please let the decisions you make leave a lasting and positive impression on them. Last year, while in attendance at a school board meeting, I was surprised to hear during the meeting's agenda that the new Royal Oaks Elementary School was over budget. Later, it was learned how grossly over budget and overbuilt the school was. It was even more confusing when almost immediately, following the closed session to discuss those particular budget problems that the decision and the proposal to close Beverly Hills Elementary School was brought to the table. Following, I watched and listened as students, teachers, and community leaders poured out their heart and soul to the superintendent and board members in support of keeping their neighborhood school. I would like to remind you that during capping, new students moving to this area were bused to specific schools to save money on busing. I watched as students move to a school out of their neighborhood and school district. I saw discipline problems increase on buses and at the school level. It was a disjointed and fractured solution to a problem that was based on data, not what was best for the students. It may have saved money, but was it worth the lives it affected? The students who never bonded, the students who, who stopped blooming, or the students who withdrew into a shell because they felt out of place. There is no amount of money that can justify not doing what is right for a child. If you want to know what impact you are having on individual students, let me share a personal experience with you. Years ago, my nephew attended Beverly Hills Elementary School. Because of a career move by his parents, my nephew had to change schools. Years later, I shared with him that I had seen the mother of one of his good friends from Beverly Hills. What I heard next stopped me in my tracks and broke my heart. His comment was, Timothy was my best friend. I never had a best friend after that. Sometimes when you look at statistics and data to support a decision, you forget who the decisions affect. 
You forget the child, the student, the young adult, the community leader they may become. Somehow what is right gets lost in the equation. I ask you as a board representing Cabarrus County Schools to choose what is right, to humanize the child, <clears throat> excuse me, to make the right decision. You have the power to influence the lives of students at Beverly Hills Elementary School in a positive manner. I trust you make the right decision in support of neighborhood schools in Cabarrus County School rather than look for more data to support the decision to close Beverly Hills because of the mistake made at Royal Oaks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. And we have Camille Luther Pittman. Yes, ma'am. Okay, welcome. Hi, my name is Camille Luther Pittman. I'm a parent of a first grader at Beverly Hills STEM Elementary School. Please do not take away the wonderful education my child has received at Beverly Hills STEM Elementary. We all must make the choice between what is right and what is easy. Beverly Hills, please keep it open. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Mrs. Keisha Sandage. Welcome. We meet again, ladies and gentlemen. How Hello. are y'all doing? So um, what if I told you today would be the last day that you can shop at your favorite grocery store, whether that be Food Lion, Harris Teeter, Public, and you had to go to Walmart? How would you feel? Big old Walmart compared to your small little Food Lion or your Publix. Well, that's what you're telling these kids. How do you feel about that? So let me tell you why you guys should save this school. We have a five-year-old attending a school in Royal and Rowan County. Every day, screaming under the table, kicking, pushing people that don't belong in their way. And then that parent getting a call almost every day when that kid is doing that to change schools and come to Cabarrus County Schools and go to Beverly Hills, no less. And all those behaviors stop. I wonder why. Can anybody answer that question for me? Is the right school your Because he was at the right school in the right community. Well, guess what? Last week, I dropped that kid off at college. And he's going to be on TV every Saturday, where we can all watch him play. And he can come back and give back to this community because of Beverly Hills. Wow. That's why you guys should save this school. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Caroline Kegel. Yes. Welcome. Hello. Um, I don't really have a lot prepared. I've already spoken like twice, I think. My children came to speak. Um, so I've had three kids at Beverly Hills. Um, what I wanted to say when I was listening to some of the people talk is that my youngest son attended Culture and Web. No, sorry. He went to Beverly Hills in kindergarten. And then when the STEM program opened up at Culture and Web, he went over to Culture and Web. And the f three years he was at Culture and Web, it was very nice, but it was never the same as being at Beverly Hills. And we felt that every day, because when he came back to Beverly Hills, when y'all made it a STEM program again, he can ride his bike over to his friend's house from, you know, like his classmates can just walk over to the house. Luke Guerrero, Laura Guerrero's son, lives right behind us. He can just walk up the hill to visit if he wants to. Um, and we never had that connect, you know, even though Culture and Web is an amazing school and it would be great for the people who live there, but it's not Beverly Hills community. So that was one point that was different when you move your kid over to another school that is not in your community. The second thing was someone said something about kids being able to go back and visit the school and serve there, teach there, become the principal or whatever. So my oldest son, he is in high school right now. He's a rising senior. And every Friday, every Friday, he goes back to Beverly Hills and he serves as a math superstar, okay, superstar um, tutor. And he works with all those little boys and girls that are in his um, former school, you know? And he goes there and he sees some of his old teachers. And you can't get that if the school's no longer there. Um, and the other thing somebody said about all these awards that we won at the school, 
I think they forgot to mention that we also got second in the fire life safety. Um, <laughs> and that is the only Cabarrus County school that, that made it to, um, I think, to the state. So, whoop, whoop. <laughs> so, um, please think about it, really, really think about it. Imagine if your kid was at this school or your grandchild was at this school, maybe it would be totally different how you would think, you know, but you got to do what you got to do. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra Cox. Welcome. I am a retired teacher of the Cabarrus County School System. Both of my children attended Beverly Hills School and I support keeping it open as well as other neighborhood schools. My son and his wife currently live in the Beverly Hills community and are expecting their first child in January. One of the primary reasons they purchased this property was so that their children would be able to attend Beverly Hills, a neighborhood school. If that does not become the case, they will be looking at alternative education resources for this child and their future children. I'm not going to repeat all the positive appeals for the Beverly Hills remaining open that has already been stated. I would just like to shed some light on another issue that I do not know if the school system has studied or addressed. Ms. Carpenter, you alluded to it, and that is the traffic nightmare trying to cross South Cannon Boulevard or Highway 29 during heavy traffic periods. I currently live in Kannapolis, so I am very familiar with the traffic conditions on Highway 29 and the problems trying to cross the highway. The most direct route is Mount Olivet Road, which is backed up on both sides of the road all during the afternoon. The current traffic-like pattern does not lend itself to a smooth flow, and I have witnessed several accidents at the intersection of 29 and Mount Olivet. The turn lane to get onto Dakota Street which is where Royal Oaks is located, gets backed up and making, and that is the problem of cars on the other side <coughs> trying to feed onto 29, especially if they are making a left turn. There is no traffic light at the end of Dakota, so when traffic is especially heavy, it is very difficult. Whenever there is a backup on I-85, mm -hmm. Highway 29 is the alternative route in that area, and it gets bumper to bumper. Cutting through the Royal Oaks community is a problem because it is a high residential area with narrow streets and there is only one major outlet to Lake Concord Road and that is Mount Olivet. When the traffic is so backed up on Mount Olivet, cars cannot get out at the intersection of Mount Olivet and revert to Pennsylvania, that is another dangerous intersection. The intersection of Dale Earnhardt and High T Highway 29 is also another extremely high congestion area, so it is not a good alternative either. All the congestion around the mall area and Copperfield Boulevard on this side of the interstate is a huge concern. I know you are thinking that all these students can just ride the bus, but you know as well as I do that many, many parents will always drive their children to school. <laughs> Royal Oaks has been closed for the past two years, and this is the current conditions that I experience right now with Royal Oaks not even being open. Would you want your children going to a highly accessible community school or one on the other side of a busy highway? Thank you, Thank you. Okay, next we have Liz Gray. Welcome. Thank you. Hi guys, good evening. My name is Liz Gray, for some of you that don't know who I am. I currently have two children in the Cabarrus County Schools. Logan, 13, who is anxiously sitting back there. He's currently attending Concord Middle. And Liam, who is a rising fourth grader at R. Brown McAllister. Um, Logan attended Beverly Hills for six years, and it was a very special place for our family. <clears throat> There's many reasons why so many of us are here today and that is to save our schools. For obvious reasons, I'm here to talk about the closing of Beverly Hills Elementary and the possible changes at R. Brown McAllister. I'm a firm believer in economic development. I'm a taxpayer in Cabarrus County, and on many levels, I pay your salaries for any changes that the school board makes in regards to our children. 
Growth is vital to many rural communities across America, which we're experiencing right here in Cabarrus County. I understand the need for growth, and I love to watch it flourish in my hometown. But to change something that has worked for so many years is not the route to go. Our schools work. They are diverse, stable, and parents and students have proven to be more engaged. Our schools are generational. I've even met some of the students who have returned to teach at some of our local elementary schools. There are many reasons why you should leave what has worked for so many years in our community alone. Money is the main reason in your eyes. Ooh, I lost my place. <laughs> Not the kids. You think that you'll be saving money by closing and changing what works. I've looked at the numbers, well, what I was available to me before I came to this meeting and saw uh, more information tonight. So my speech has changed a little bit. <clears throat> I've spoken to people in my neighborhood whose properties are at stake by the changes that may occur. Leave them alone. Bullying never got anyone anywhere. This is what we teach our kids, right? Not to bully? What example are we setting for our youth? By bulldozing their futures and all that they have known by using our neighborhood schools. Our current neighborhood schools are in despair, but they are fixable. If we are growing so much, then we can afford to just build a new school. <clears throat> I pay a lot of money for my current home where I've been living for the past years. The number one reason why I bought the home where I'm currently living is because of the school district that it was in. I'm sure that many other parents can say the same in this room that are here. The kids that attend these schools feel like they're in touch with their neighborhood. My kids can freely roam my neighborhood to and from their school and it's safe. I don't think that that would be possible for the rest of the kids that are at Beverly Hills Elementary. I'm gonna wrap this up real quick. So I'm gonna ask you to quit torturing all the parents in here. Please make a wise decision when you're voting because we do vote and a lot of you are up for re-election. So keep that in mind. Um, it's really important that you listen to everybody that's here tonight and make the correct decision for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie, is it Benyon? Okay, welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, just wanted to talk, I have four boys, three who currently go to Beverly Hills Elementary School, and we are in the neighborhood where we can walk to school. And it has been shown that stimulation for boys in particular um, are good for the brains, gets the brains moving and um, helps them learn. And as of right now, recess, is either limited or pushed to the end of the day and they're forced to sit in class, sit in class, without moving, jittery, getting around too much. Um, PE is on a rotating schedule versus every day as it was when I used to go to school. And if these boys and kids don't sit in the classrooms, then they are diagnosed as ADHD, ADD, and given medication for them to help sit down and focus. Now, you're asking the kids, my kids, that we currently walk to school, to sit in a bus or a car for 20 minutes and then sit again for another remainder of their school day until they get their PE once every seven days, I believe, or recess, maybe at the end of the school year, at the end of the school day, maybe in the middle, maybe after lunch. And again, if they're not sitting, then they're diagnosed as possibly having some kind of behavior issues or ADHD, ADD. Um, more kids nowadays are being medicated versus figuring out what the problem is and changing it by diet, by exercise, um, or maybe they're just being boys and they need that stimulation. They need to get out and move and be active. They need that hands-on. Um, again, Big Pharma is ready to give them pill. It's an easy, quick, easy, quick and easy fix um, versus taking the time and effort to address the problem. So I just wanted to say, please, just let us continue to walk to school so I don't have to medicate all my kids as <laughs> kids think, as parents think, as teachers think that all kids need to be sitting still. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, okay, so 25 had previously canceled and 26 is not here either. Okay, uh, 27, Chris Hughes. My name is Chris Hughes. I reside on Palisade Drive, a, a street that hosts two special special places for Concord. 
One is it's the host of the staging area for the, for the Thanksgiving Day Parade or the Thanksgiving <laughs> Parade. And the other is it's the home just at two blocks from my house of Beverly Hills Elementary. I have two children, neither of which attended Beverly Hills High, uh, Beverly Hills Elementary, because we didn't move here until five years ago. But we are part of Beverly Hills. We're part of the community. There's two things that I can hear every afternoon from, my, from the front porch of my house. The children laughing and playing at Beverly Hills Elementary and the bells of Epworth United Methodist Church. It makes Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills. A critical component of community, of any community, <laughs> is the common spaces that are part of that community. For 60 years, Beverly Hills Elementary has served as that common space, a space where children make friends, where teachers build lives, where parents meet each other and community is formed. <coughs> to close Beverly Hills Elementary is to, as someone else said today, is to cut out the heart of the community. When we close neighborhood schools, studies have shown over and over again that when neighborhood schools are closed, property values go down. We if Beverly Hills is eventually closed, the property values of my property and my neighbor's property goes down. And the taxes collected from our property goes down. And the budget of the school board, of, the sco of our school system, goes down. I'm asking that instead that you remember the heart of a community that keeps a community together. And it also makes good fiscal sense because it keeps property values up. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Becky Hughes. Yes. Welcome. Hi, I'm Becky Hughes. First of all, thank you for inviting us or allowing us to speak today. As my husband said, uh, we moved here five years ago. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit. My husband got transferred here. He grew up in the Charlotte area, but we came from uh, Arlington, Texas. So when we came, uh, I pronounced it Concord. <laughs> uh, I quickly learned the difference. Um, and I was looking around, really, it, the slate was clean as far as where we wanted to live. Uh, I was thinking about Charlotte, but Chris's job was in Concord. So I thought, I think we should support the city where the job is. So that's why we decided to look around Concord, and I had no preconceived ideas. I had no friends here, didn't know anybody from Adam. Well, we looked into the Beverly Hills area, and the thing that sold me on our house was that we had a school not only in our neighborhood, but way down our street. Uh, we had a park two blocks away, um, and it, it hasn't failed to disappear, uh, disappoint me. We have a church across the street from us. All of that was wonderful for me. Well, uh, I know of one a couple doors down across the street that bought their house because uh, they wanted their kids to go to Beverly Hills because not only did they go to Beverly Hills, but so did their parents, so the kids' grandparents. And they wanted to continue the tradition. And they just bought their house. And they're uh, in like uh, first and second grade. Then we have three houses. Of those three houses, two of them were single occupant people that passed away by the time I moved here. And one of them, he moved. 
And I've seen people regularly looking at the houses. We have a big uh, front window. And all the people that are looking are young families or young people. And I've seen a lot of kids going in and out of the houses looking at them. We're not gentrifying as a neighborhood because it keeps flipping. And I just want you to know that in our at, in Beverly Hills, what I've seen, and I've heard at least two or three other speakers talk about people coming in and moving here. Please, please keep Beverly Hills because we want to keep growing. We want to stay a young or the ability to be a young neighborhood. So I'm just asking you kindly, please keep Beverly Hills open. I'm counting on y'all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so 29 is not here. Next we have John Howard. Welcome. Thank you, Cabarrus County School Board, for allowing me to speak to you tonight about Beverly Hills Elementary School. My name's John Howard. My wife and I live at Oak Leaf Condos, and I'm 75 years old. I share that with you because I want you to know that in 1955, my mother, father, sister, and I lived on Wilmar. And my friends that we played with were getting ready to go to a new school. That new school was Beverly Hills, and we were going to be in the sixth grade. We were going to be top dogs down at that new school. <laughs> Our teacher was Mr. Freeze. Our principal was Mr. Freeze. <laughs> and we operated the school store, and we also worked as the receptionist for our principal. My parents supported that school. And I want to move forward a little bit and let you know that later in life, my wife and I and our two children lived on Arbor Street in a home that my father purchased in 1940. My son Jay and my daughter Sissy attended Beverly Hills Elementary School. There were five years difference in their age, so my wife and I had the privilege of, su of supporting that school for 11 years. They walked down Central Drive, went by Joe Probst's backyard, jumped across the little old creek, but not always. <laughs> and they got to Beverly Hill School. I share that with you to let you know the depth of appreciation and concern that I have for this school. Just as all of these people that sit behind me and have been up here and brought all kind of factual information to you. I'm no, I have no PowerPoint to display to give you mathematical reasons why that school should be taken away. But I can tell you from my heart, in the heart of the people that are standing back here, and from the conscience of all of these people, that you shouldn't do that. Beverly Hills is part of the fabric of the greater Wilmar Park area. And just like an old chair in your home, that's beautiful and has been worn, that's kind of the way Beverly Hills is right now. But you know, an old chair, an old bench has great character. It has great bones. And it's very easy to take that piece of furniture that has a use for you, your children, and your children's children, and take it and have it reupholstered and give it new life, new life for new people. Thank you. Andrea Burleson? Yes, ma'am. I Welcome. am Andrea Burleson. Brief mo moment to read here. Um, the current Cabarrus County School Strategic Plan states... <laughs> Um, different goals that it has in place and under those goals it has objectives of how to obtain those goals 
And goal number four reads that Cabarrus County Schools has effective and efficient financial facility and technology systems, as well as community partnerships to serve its students, parents, and educators. Objective 4.2 under this goal states that increased number of student seats to meet growth in our community. So this is a way that we plan to support goal number four. As Mr. Parker stated, growth is here. And so it seems counterintuitive to this objective to eliminate a school if we're trying to increase seats. Objective 4.3 states that you want to increase professional, community, and parental partnerships. Well, I don't think I need to say much more about how removing Beverly Hills is going to be effective with the community partnership. Um, but personally, from a parental partnership, it's effective. I have four boys, two of which who currently attend Beverly Hills. And for me to envision myself going any more distance to try and have a parental relationship with the school, to volunteer, to eat lunch with my boys, it will be a strain. I work within a mile of the school, and obviously I live within the school district, so it's very important to me that the school stay exactly where it is so that my involvement can be there. So if the school is closed, and again, it seems to be in opposition of an objective to meet a goal that is currently in the Cabarrus County School Strategic Plan, I don't know if any of you have had the privilege to ride through the neighborhood. Um, there are many people who aren't here who have signs up in their yard and hoping to make a statement to please save our school. Not only because they have children who go to that school, but because the value of what taking a school out of community does to the properties that are there. I don't know if any of you have ventured off into other counties, but I recently was in East Spencer. The Dunbar Center that is there was a thriving school at one time. The community was great. But to look at that place now, it is impoverished. And it does not look what it was the day the school was there. You know the effects of what it is that your decision will weigh. I want you to envision like throwing a stone into a pond. What happens? For every action, there is a reaction. Just as you picture that stone going into the water, yes, that was a today thing that you did. It was a moment. But the ripples still take place. And the ripple of what it is that your decision is, is going to have lasting effect. Thank you for keeping Beverly Hills. Um, Mr. Bob Cole? Yes, hi. Did I was you? blessed to move to Concord 35 years ago and had two children go to uh, Beverly Hills School. But as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from North Carolina. I was raised on the, on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands, and I had a grandfather who was uneducated, but one of the smartest men I ever met. I asked him when I was 10 years old, or he asked me when I was 10 years old, what do you want to be, Bobby? And I said, I want to be what makes you the proudest. And he said, the only thing I ask of you is to be a man of honor. And I've tried to live that in my whole life. I went in the Marine Corps, served in Vietnam. And you know, Semper Fidelis is always faithful. Live with honor. I was blessed to be a teacher at Concord High School. I was a coach. And I tried to live these dreams. We have to save Beverly Hills. You all are in a great, responsible position. You chose to run and you were elected. And congratulations on that. But you have grave responsibilities. And I'm not talking statistics. I'm not talking numbers. I'm talking about these areas outside of these things. What drew our children to Beverly Hills, what draws, and that's bad English, but people to Cabarrus <laughs> County. This school as someone mentioned before, is the soul of honor. It is a school of honor. You're in a position that dictates and demands you being honorable. You have to stand up for causes sometimes that are not shown on a computer, are not numbers to be read, 
But the time has come for each and every one of you to look inside of yourself and be people of honor. Thank you. Thank you. And you would think I remember how to say your name. Is it Brancha? Brancha, good, yes. Brancha Shalfant. Welcome. When moving here 45 years ago, the schools were not yet consolidated. There were no public kindergartens, and almost any road would pass by farms that had been in families for generations. Those same farms, particularly on the western part of our county, no longer raise crops, but sprout housing developments and apartment complexes with the demand for more schools, more expensive transportation, and new roads. We have not voiced objections to our tax dollars constantly being funneled to these new areas of massive growth because the need is there. But we have voted for every school bond in the belief that our existing schools would be well supported, well cared for, and protected from destruction. Please remember the old playground mandate that says, we must share and share alike. Beverly Hills has not gotten its fair share. I must mention again, your superintendent has publicly stated that Beverly Hills is decrepit. I have seen schools in Washington and New Orleans that would make Beverly Hills look like a palace. But five to 10 year old children do not need a palace. They need safety, security, and comfort in their environment. They do not need a nearly 30 foot entry atrium that stands as a monument to the waste of our limited resources. We have repeatedly been told that the routine maintenance left undone at Beverly Hills is deferred maintenance. And upon that peg, you were asked to close a beloved and historic school. Why was work not done when it should have been? And who is responsible for this dereliction of duty? Why destroy a school precious to the city core and its families? Why have the alternatives to keeping Beverly Hills functional not been fully explored? There is room to expand if necessary, but with Royal Oaks having such a large seating capacity, our student population would remain fairly static. Please do not disregard the significant numbers that others have presented to you which illustrate the potential financial and civic fallout from closing Beverly Hills. As board members, you have a unique opportunity to make an incredible difference in people's lives and to have a lasting impact on our county, to swim upstream, as it were, to refute the status quo that says bigger is better, and to prove that you are indeed supportive of all of your constituents' needs. Urban sprawl does take its toll on all our infrastructures, but cities both large and small have always cared enough to respect and to salvage their beginnings. Please allow this slice of our history to remain, and by choosing to sustain Beverly Hills, you will have chosen to protect our children. It is within your power to create a legacy, a legacy of excellent stewardship. Unlike the story of Rumpelstiltskin, we cannot give you our firstborn children, but we have given you, each of you, what's in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, number 34 is not here, uh, so we'll go to 35, Joni Liebel. Hi, good evening. My name's Joni Liebel, and I, I thank you for allowing me to speak here tonight. I'm a 30-year neighbor of Beverly Hills Elementary School. My, my daughters graduated from Beverly Hills Elementary School. Um, and I had sent everybody an email with some of my concerns, but I just wanted to reiterate a few of them tonight. Um, I'm asking you to keep Beverly Hills open as a viable elementary school, as a viable neighborhood elementary school. Point one, have you truly considered the value of preserving an existing neighborhood school with strong support? The citizens of Beverly Hills and the city of Concord have shared their concerns about what happens to a community when a school closes. As Scott Padgett mentioned in the previous meeting, the communities surrounding Logan and Long schools have failed to recover following the closing of these schools. The, the former president of the National Association of Elementary School Principals stated, you take out the school and that's the beginning of the decline of the neighborhood. You've got to have a school to have a neighborhood. 
Schools are part of the anchor that holds communities together. The school introduces people who would not otherwise, who would otherwise remain strangers to each other. It helps build a sense of community, which is central to solving some of society's bigger challenges, <coughs> education included. The second point, we talked about uh, the feasibility study that was done in-house. Uh, the National Trust of Historic Preservation recommends that feasibility studies be performed comparing the cost of new schools with those of renovating existing schools before new schools are built and existing ones abandoned. They recommend hiring architects with experience in rehabilitation work to conduct these <coughs> studies. These studies would also consider the impact of a school's closing on existing neighborhoods, long-term transportation costs, and municipal service burdens. You have a tough decision ahead of you, and again, I ask that you consider keeping Beverly Hills open as a viable neighborhood elementary school. Thank you. Tess Ward, welcome. Hello. It is a fact that small schools help students achieve. It is a fact that small schools save money. It is the fact that students that come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds enter elementary school already significantly behind their economically advantaged peers. These are facts that cannot be ignored, and the research done in large-scale scientific studies proves it. Two separate studies done by national researchers at major universities found that smaller schools make the difference in helping students achieve. And not only that, but smaller schools are crucial for students that come from poorer backgrounds, i.e. Title I schools. An article referencing these two studies wrote, creating a better school may be as simple as creating a smaller one. Separate studies credit small schools with reducing the negative effects of poverty on student achievement, reducing student violence, increasing parent involvement, and making students feel accountable for their behavior and grades. Why is this relevant to us here tonight and relevant to the city of Concord as a whole? Because you are on a dangerous path with many repercussions. If you vote to close or consolidate Beverly Hills, you are not only ignoring and potentially destroying a thriving community that revolves around this school, but you are setting a precedence throughout the county. Which small neighborhood Title I school is next? These schools are on the front line helping the students in our community that are most in need. If you move these students from a small, culturally diverse neighborhood elementary school to a larger faceless school of over 600 students, you're putting them in harm's way. The larger the school, the more power you give poverty, and our students will bear the brunt of your decisions. Researchers found that smaller schools cut poverty's power rating by between 20 and 70 percent, usually by 30 to 50 percent depending on grade level. Why did you run for school board? You are here to be the checks and balance to protect the needs of the community, the parents, the students, and the teachers. But your number one responsibility is to the students. And if you vote to close Beverly Hills, you are failing them. If you choose to change what has already brought people to Concord in the first place by abandoning our traditional schools that were already in place, you are hurting the very students you are elected to protect. Please hear us. No more patting members of this community on the head and ignoring our pleas. We have been told that it's too expensive to keep these schools open, but you will end up spending more money by having to bus more students. And by increasing the size of elementary schools, you will increase the cost of interventions spent over the lifetime of the students when you don't solve their educational issues in elementary school. This board has spent money left and right. $150,000 was spent to pass the buck to an outside firm to handle redistricting so you won't have to feel uncomfortable when you pass us in the street. What could we have done with that money for our students? Maybe my children at Culture and Web wouldn't have to lose their excellent music program that is going to be slashed in half due to lack of funds. Please, no more doubling down and throwing more money at mistakes that were made, like building schools that were too large, or having to pay for dirt on land that you bought to build a school that was not suitable for building. This board approved a request for $860,000 from the county for unsuitable soil. Not only that, but you have pitted parents and community members against one another by cherry picking what schools you support. Here's the secret. Every child deserves the right to a small neighborhood school that will get to know their family and meet their individual needs. We have been given a gift in Concord small schools and we should be looking to emulate them in the future, not destroy them, and move to a model of public education that has been proven time again to be a catastrophic mistake. Do the right thing. Listen to your fellow community members. Listen to the children and the parents. Listen to the facts. Keep our schools small and keep Beverly Hills open. Thank you very much. Thank you. So 37 is not here. We'll now have Melissa Golder. Welcome.
Good evening. evening. Thank you for listening. I'm sure you're tired. Um, I'm tired. It's exhausting to think almost every day for eight months about what losing our elementary school would mean for my family and for these incredible neighbors that are here tonight. I'm tired of worrying about losing my American dream, the dream of building security through home ownership in a stable neighborhood and walking to school with my kids and chatting with neighbors along the way. I see glimmers of my American dream when we walk by the school and my four-year-old says, Mommy, that's going to be my school. I'm tired because I stay awake at night and I wonder. I wonder whether the subjective charts and tables will win or whether an understanding will prevail that, as a wise woman in this room once told me, a school is so much more than a building. I wonder if this board will facilitate prosperity or will act in a way that devalues community in a very significant way. I wonder if you worry about then losing students and their related per pupil funding to charter schools or perhaps municipal schools as House Bill 514 has advanced. I wonder if you can understand the feeling of hearing that everyone else gets a new school but you. I wonder how many of you would appreciate being discontinued when you turn 65. I wonder if this group is able to admit the bias we all have, yet strive to make an objective decision. Mr. Harrison, I appreciated your question regarding peer review earlier, and I hope you push the staff for a better answer than the one that was given. We heard earlier that numbers support closure. However, many aspects of the Cropper study that I saw support keeping the school open. And I have a handout for you in that regard. (laughs) I'll hand to you when I'm done. The most notable finding maybe that I saw was that Beverly Hills is the only elementary zone in the district showing population growth to 2025. If you look at the the study, it's it's incredible how Beverly Hills sticks out as being just solid or growing compared to a lot of other schools that are decreasing actually in size over time as projected by the demographic firm that the district has paid. So yes, we're all tired, but you must find the spirit to do the right thing. This can be a win-win. The first and last pages of your 10-year plan ensure that it's only a snapshot of options. Let's quote. There is room to change it, but it takes courage to deviate from what is being pushed as the only way. Life is full of complex decisions, and you good people have chosen a position where you have to make more of those than the average person. Usually decisions aren't black and white, but in this case it is. It's yes or no. You will side with the destructive or you will side with the constructive. You will build or you will destroy. If this school closes, the neighborhood and especially its children will be grieving a loss. We all agree there's too much grief in American schools today, but in this case, it is avoidable. As Ms. Carpenter said in your last meeting, you all have one vote. Vote no to closure, and then we can all get some rest. Okay, our next speaker is Nancy Friesfager. Welcome. It's time to take a deep breath, delay the decision of closing Beverly Hills Elementary School with, and sit down with other stakeholders, including our city leaders, property owners, business owners, and other community community service providers. The proposed state budget provides the city an opportunity to participate in school funding. Why not bring them into the conversation? Personally, I'd like to see the rebirth of Concord continue. We are resilient, and we have overcome many bumps in the road. Citizens of Concord want neighborhood schools to be part of the equation. So I ask you to consider, number one, data can be flawed. In 1988, demographic consultants did not project a lot of school age growth in the county. My father, former superintendent, Dr. Joe Fries, was puzzled because he felt experts underestimated future growth. Number two, we can study other data on the new community school movement, which shows the benefits of neighborhood schools. And that's where common sense factors into the equation. 
An article in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend discusses the overprotected American child, and I quote, why not let them walk to school alone? Parents and communities are figuring out ways to give their children more independence, and it just may help them become less anxious, more self-reliant adults. The city of Concord builds greenways to promote walking. The Cabarrus Health Alliance promotes good health by encouraging people to walk. Let's be healthy. It's all about quality of life, physically, emotionally, and economically. The best decision tonight is no decision, followed by a strategy that is inclusive of all parties affected by the closing of a school. Please have an open mind. Good research is coming out in support of neighborhood schools. Would it be possible to study this data and its impact on the students? It's a terrible thing when a school closes. It provides so many services to the community. It is a place where community partnerships and innovation happen. Please consider our concerns. Consider the positive impacts that neighborhood schools have on student outcomes. Your decision will affect an impact lives for years to come. Neighborhood schools have benefits that other programs do not offer, and a lot of great people are a product of Beverly Hills Elementary School. In closing, I'd just like to share that I love the sounds of the neighborhood, the children playing the chatter while they walk to school. At the end of life, at the end of my parents' life, they would sit on the back porch and they would hear the children at recess while they were playing outside. On mother's deathbed, she heard the children playing. As the hospice nurse asked, what time is school dismissed? Mother's eyes and ears perked up, and hearing the children in the background, her soul was, was dismissed to heaven. Please don't take away the life of Beverly Hill School. Next, we have Victor Gomez. Hello. Welcome. My name is Victor Gomez. I'm at 179 Scenic Drive. When I first moved to Beverly Hills 23 years ago, it's ironic that I'm following Nancy because I moved right across the street from her. And her dad lived right next door. I didn't know who they were. I just knew, knew that they were my neighbors, and they were always friendly. As I look around the room tonight, I see all my neighbors and friends. I see children that are here tonight that I spoke, that walked to school. I see them as I drive to work, and I see them walking to school. The city has passed more sidewalks in our neighborhood. Construction has not begun. But, as you know, the DOT takes time. And, but we're getting more sidewalks. Beverly Hills is a walkable neighborhood. People drive to, neighbor, to Beverly Hills, park their cars, and walk our neighborhood. Uh, that's a fact. Um, I travel all over this country. I recently got back from San Francisco, working in the financial district, seeing people on the streets of San Francisco and the shape that they're in. And I was glad to be driving back on 85 when I got back and I said, this is home. This is home because I've lived here and raised my family here for 23 years. I'm the president of the Neighborhood Association. I'm a vice president of a company. I travel all over the country and work for a large financial firm. The, the one thing, I didn't want to bring up numbers, but the one thing that stood out tonight was the $10.3 million um, to maintain uh, the building. It's a, we said um, we fell way behind in maintenance, and that really shocked me because if somebody in the business world said we have $10.3 million dollars of back orders, somebody's going to get in trouble. 
And I don't know who's responsible for that, but if there's other schools with that backlog, somebody better do some checks and balances because that really caught my eye. And I'm not a big numbers guy, but I sit in a lot of construction meetings, and if somebody is sitting in a construction meeting and brings a number like that, it's going to get somebody's attention. Thank you. Kimberly, Kimberly Hunter, welcome. Hello, my name is Kimberly Hunter. I'm an almost 20 year resident of Cabarrus County. I moved here to leave Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. I'm a mom, a lifelong advocate for education and access for all, and I'm a voter. The main draw for us moving to Cabarrus County was the school system. I had no idea when I moved to Concord that I would be at so many schools, but here's my history. Two children. My first son, who's now an adult, went to Wolf Meadow. Uh, then he went to J.M. Freeze before STEM. Then J.M. Robinson for a year when uh, Hickory Ridge opened. And so then he moved to Hickory Ridge and was the second graduating class at Hickory Ridge. Meantime, I have a daughter who started out at Pitt School Elementary and went all the way through. She's the only one in our family to stay in one school. Uh, she then went to the J.N. Free STEM program, and she's now a proud student at Northwest Cabarrus STEM. My husband and I and my daughter now live in my dream neighborhood. Finally, this is the neighborhood I wanted to live in all those years ago, but as a young mom, young husband, we couldn't afford it at the time. So now we're in a dream neighborhood. We're in the McAllister School District. Concord Middle and Concord High. And again, she doesn't go to Concord High because she's in that STEM program at Northwest. Um, while my daughter was at Pitt School, she was really excited to move to that neighborhood and she wanted me to, she wanted to go to school. She wanted to, to walk, to ride her bike. Um, we tried it a couple of times. It's very dangerous, there's no sidewalks. There was speeding cars, it was, it was not a neighborhood school. Even though we were close, it was just not feasible for her. Um, when we had the opportunity to move, we did, even though it wasn't if impacting her, but I could see the value in the neighborhood school. And I remembered how much I liked that downtown area, so we, we bought our house. So I'm here today speaking to you as a concerned voter who loves Concord, who loves Cabarrus County. Um, as a homeowner, I'm here because I'm concerned about my home's value. The, the reason we are in this area is because of the schools. Um, as a constituent, it seems to me that there's two governing bodies of the area that I live in, and it seems like you guys are in conflict with each other. Those two areas are the Cabarrus County School Board and the City of Concord. The City of Concord is promoting Concord as a family-friendly environment. The School Board, by closing neighborhood schools, is in direct opposition of that. You can tell by everybody here, we want our neighborhood schools. So, um, I want you to keep the schools open. The voters from all over the county are going to be watching, and I have no bone in this fight besides owning a house at McAllister, which isn't currently on your list. More importantly, um, my daughter's going to be watching. My son's going to be watching. They want neighborhood schools. All these kids that are growing up in Be Beverly Hills are going to be wanting neighborhood schools. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Burpa. Welcome. My name is Michael Burpo, and I am a fourth grade, going into fifth grade student at Beverly Hills. I'm glad to be here and talk about why I love the school. So I'm gonna get started. Um, first up, um, all my friends at Beverly Hills love our school so much that's almost like there are these pathways that connect our bond to the school. And nothing gets in the way of those paths. And those paths tell us that we're home and this is where we belong. And to me, we don't need to be going to a fine arts school that's twice the size of the school we have. To me, the only thing we need is people who work together to 
care for us and teach us everything we need for the future. One more thing is that um, me and my friends didn't know that our school was old or different until the board and everyone started mentioning it. <laughs> mentioning it. And once they, thank you, thank you. And to me, um, I don't think it's really a, if you look at it from the outside, it's old. But what you need to look at is the inside of the school. And if you look on the inside, you can see new people who make new friends, learn new things, and all make new memories at that place. I'm glad to be here, and I hope you think about what we're saying, and thank you. Thank you. do enjoy hearing from the youngsters. <laughs> uh, Terry Smith. Hi, my name is Terry Smith and um, thank you board for allowing me the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I am a nearly 20 year resident of the city of Concord. Um, my children um, have been in the Cabarrus County schools for nearly a decade. Um, my home school is R. Brown McAllister, um, and so in some ways, you know, why would I even care? You know, my kids are in middle school, about to go to high school. Why would I even care about Beverly Hills? You know, I, um, I live in, on South Union. I mean, I should really care more about R. Brown. Well, I do care about R. Brown. I care about Culture and Web because I feel like whatever happens to Beverly Hills will impact those schools. 20 years ago when I um, got out of residency and moved back to North Carolina um, to get a job at um, what is now Atrium Health Northeast, um, I, um, I was a single person, not married, no children, but I knew how important it was to live in a neighborhood that had a community school. And that's why I specifically looked um, in the downtown Concord area and I found my home on South Union Street where I've been there for nearly 20 years. Um, there is so much value in community schools, and small community schools um, that you know are intangible. And um, as a pediatrician, um, I, I really understand what the social determinants of health are. And that's a big buzzword, in, buzzwords I should say, in uh, the medical community, it's kind of, it, kind of grew in the early 2000s, but what we're finding out is that how communities impact our children and how they can flourish um, as a result of what these determinants are. And one of the things that they have found is they've done all these studies on adults, but they're finding it, it um, really what we need to do is look at what's happening with our children and especially early childhood and how education impacts those children. And so I find that when you consolidate schools and have these mega schools, um, that children tend to get lost in the shuffle. They fall through the cracks and they don't, people don't address those so social determinants of health. And in my job, you know, I see a child, I see children every day and of course, I'm worried about that child, but I'm worried about their parents, I'm worried about their siblings, I'm worried about the children they'll have. And so I think it's really important to think not just what's gonna happen in the next five years or the next 10 years, but to think about what's gonna happen in the next several generations. Just like the Board of Education did 70 years ago when they opened up Beverly Hills Elementary School. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And please, please do not close the school. Uh, Lydia Caruth? Yes, I am Lydia Caruth. I have children that went to Beverly Hills and grandchildren that went to Beverly Hills. And I love that school. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I know that you have hard decisions to make and that's what you're elected for. 
But when you take a boat on Beverly Hills, remember that you're not just replacing a school with a newer school, or you're not starting a new trend to shut down schools. Every time in Cabarrus County in the 23 years I've lived here that there's been a need for a school, one's been built. In every long range plan during that same period of time, no school was ever shut down, its community dissolved, and the students scattered. This situation is unique. Plans have already been made to replace other downtown schools. So what is the future of Beverly Hills? If you, if you vote to close Beverly Hills, your actions will lack logical sense. Why Beverly Hills? Is it in worse shape than R. Brown McAllister? Does it not have the same political clout as R. Brown or Coltrane Webb? You see, when a school has been in, in existence for 60 years, how do you make it just vanish without a ripple effect on the community in which it's a part? This is a tough decision to make, and I know that. But I just have two thoughts to leave with you. If you feel you have no other option than to close Beverly Hills, I'm so sorry, but I think you have other options. But just so we'll go there, okay? Please don't let that be your final action. This community deserves much more than a weed-infested, crumbling building that, it's, that is at the very gateway of the community. Why not create a task force of community members and stakeholders to think about the ideas for reuse of this property? If you don't have plans for the building or wish to pursue them, you might want to return the property to the Board of the Commissioners so that they can ensure that the building is used for other purposes so that it remains a viable part of the community. We are Beverly Hills community. All these people and all the people that have come to all these meetings. We want to keep our school open because it is indeed the heart of our community. We love our school and we're waiting for and we're watching your vote. Thank you. Amos McClory, welcome. Good evening. Thank you all for allowing me to speak this evening. I know so many of you up there. Uh, my purpose here is I don't, I don't have a, a kid at Beverly Hills. Uh, I never went to Beverly Hills. Uh, but Beverly Hills' story uh, is the same story that I have. Those of you who are still here and live in that Beverly Hills community, Logan and Shankertown are two schools that went through. Those schools went through exactly what you are facing. Um, when the schools closed in May 1968, by November, the buildings were pushed down to bricks in less than three months after the school closed. To you on the school board, we say to you, the economic impact on the community, uh, the community impact is why that school was put there in the first place because of what was there. People lived in that community and they needed a school um, they paid what the going cost was to have a school built in their community at that time. 55, 60 years later, um, sure it aged. Sure it cost to keep it in that community. But the school was put there because of the community. Now, we know uh, when you move a school, you can't rename Beverly Hills anywhere else in this county. It's, it's named after the community. They can't even get a school built anywhere else in the county and call it Beverly Hills. It won't fit, just like Logan. You can't put another school and name it Logan in another community but Logan. So those of you that live in Beverly Hills, I understand your fight. And I say to this board, if you close it down because of the dollars and throwing away the livelihood of the people, which one is more important to you? Dollars are always going to be an issue. But the people who live in that community, they don't go anywhere. The only, the only place they go when the school closes is down. People come to this county and they want to buy a home. If it's a home open in Beverly Hills, they won't buy there because there's not a school there. They're looking for schools when they come to this community, when they come to this county. Where's the nearest school? Well, there's houses open in Beverly Hills. Is there a school there? No. Makes it hard for those people to sell. Makes it hard for them to live. 
in that community without that, that, that engine that drives them. Now, I say to you on the board, don't be on the wrong side of history. Did y'all hear me? Yes, sir. I don't, I don't think you heard me. I said, don't be on the wrong side of his story. His story. <laughs> Kelly Dodds. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Kelly Dodds. Um, closing Beverly Hills will not only have a huge ripple effect on our community, families, and teachers, but most of all, our children. We have been a part of the Beverly Hills family for over 12 years, and all four of my children have attended. My last is now in kindergarten, and I wanted so much for her to be able to experience Beverly Hills like her siblings. When I say family, I mean these teachers and entire staff have treated my children as their own. We briefly put one of our daughters in the STEM program at Patriots when it first started and we moved her from Patriots Elementary after only four months. Come to find out she was extremely upset every day and would cry for about 20 minutes after getting to school because of the anxieties of the long bus ride and how overwhelming Patriots was in comparison to Beverly Hills. We put her back at Beverly Hills, back with her family, and she was so much better. She felt safe and secure. When we place our children in a larger seat school or have longer bus times, these kids will not only have new heightened anxieties, but simply become just a number. I would like to propose you don't close the door on Beverly Hills family. I am asking you to stand up for what's right, at least for the sake of our children. Thank you. And Mary Catherine Ewart? Ewart. Ewart. Almost. Thank you. Last one. I don't know. I have two Take. more names here. Maybe they're not here. Well, I don't know. There was nobody behind me, so. <laughs> okay. okay. Maybe I ran them off. <laughs> Y'all are tired. Everybody's tired. Good evening. My name is Mary Catherine Ewart. I live in, within the city of Concord, and I am a graduate of Cabarrus County Schools. I'm standing here with two questions and one follow-up question because Mr. Harrison took my first question, but I appreciate you. That's a good thing. I appreciate you asking that question, but I have three questions actually to ask to the staff. So I hope you will ask it on my behalf. The first question, and this is follow-up to Mr. Harrison's question in regards to the steel tariffs is, when will the state construction data be updated to reflect the materials cost increase? Because I promise you there is one, and I'll tell you why later. My second question is how are you taking into effect the planned growth as projected by the city of Concord, the city of Kannapolis, and Cabarrus County? My third question is how are you accounting for the unemployment costs that are, um, I'm sorry, how are you accounting for the personnel, personnel consolidation savings with unemployment costs? Because there will be unemployment costs. Now, why should you listen to me? I'm not a parent of a child at Beverly Hills. I did not go to Beverly Hills. I went to R. Brown. I went to Concord Middle and graduated from Concord High. I am a proud spider. My mother is a retired teacher from Cabarrus County Schools. She served 25 years in this, in this system. This was the only system she served in. But my brother is a substitute at Beverly Hills. He is loved there, and I feel the love for them. And so I felt it was important for me to ask these questions. Now, how do I come up with these questions? Well, two reasons. One, my background is performance improvement. I hold a master's degree in instructional and performance technology. So this right here is my world. I love it. I get excited to read data. And I'm probably one of the few people that do that. <laughs> but I'm currently, I'm also managing not one, but two construction projects in old buildings. 
One building was built in the 30s. The second building was built in the mid 40s. So I appreciate and I understand the costs associated to code upgrade. I appreciate and understand the challenges of an old building, but you have to love an old building and you have to love an old neighborhood. So I challenge you, take those questions and go back and reevaluate your data because my recommendation is to reevaluate the data. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Bassley, so we've reached the end of the list. We have two uh, folks who signed up and um, have left. Okay, thank you. Okay, board members, this is the conclusion of the public hearing. I'll take a motion that the public hearing on the proposed closing of Beverly Hills Elementary School be closed to public input. So moved, Madam Chair. Second. Second. Okay, Dr. Kirk, and I think Mr. Harrison piped in first. All in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the public hearing is now closed. Uh, we have reached the end of our agenda before we go into closed session. I will say that um, if you all want to just wait a moment, uh, normally when we have an item on the work session, we do vote the prior business meeting, so I do expect this to be on the agenda next Monday. So. I think you're right. So you're saying the next step here is to make a vote next Monday? That's so what I would anticipate. Seven days instead of waiting a month? Yeah, to because... To let people evaluate what we've just been presented with? Um, yes, just because we've had we've seen all this information before, very little has changed. We got a whole presentation just today. Right, and most of that information we have seen before. Yeah, no, so. it's consolidated. I don't think that the... I think... I didn't want to put that put it on the July meeting, and we really need to have a, an up or down. Okay. Well, I'd like to see it on the July meeting. That's me. That's one person. I'll say that. We're not voting on adding it to the agenda right now. <laughs> so, what's that? But they are adding something to the agenda. We haven't voted to add it to the agenda. We ad haven't voted to add it to the agenda tonight. If you all could um, either quiet down or go on the hallway if you need to talk. We're trying to hear each other up here. Thank you. Okay, uh, who made the motion? Okay, I made the motion. Rich, do we need to amend tonight's agenda first before we would do add an item to vote on? You announced to be on the agenda for next week. You announced to be on the agenda for next week. In our normal pattern of work session to business meeting mm -hmm. and so in creating the agenda for next week you've got a motion the second on the floor to change that agenda I know what I'm asking is the way we need to have a motion to amend tonight's agenda no, first no. okay so there's a motion in the second to put this on Rob the July the July I don't think uh, voting on it next week's appropriate as opposed to the June 11th meeting so all in favor of putting it on the July agenda Say aye. I yes. What are the ramifications? I think more people are out of town in July, which is why we wanted to do the public hearing in June. Um, and also, if there is a change in direction, that we amend the ten-year plan, because that would have to go with it. Um, that the realignment committee needs to know that sooner than later. Yeah, if the if, is, if yeah, board members are we still in session? I mean, yes. We yeah. are. Yes. So this hit our mics, I'm sorry. Yes, correct. Hit mics. So the question is if board members have a large number of questions, will staff be able to answer the questions this week and provide the data? I would guess that that's probably going to rely on exactly what the question is, but we would certainly do our best to, to give you everything we could get in, in a 
reasonable time. There may be questions out there that may take longer to answer or research or whatever. It may be a little more difficult. So to say 100% sure, no, but we'd do everything we could to get those answers for you. What's Three. Keep conversation going. Um, uh, what is um, what is the urgency of June the 11th? To not have the vote in July when we have a combined meeting and parents are on, families are on vacation. Is there any impact to the county's schedule um, or other committee it's, schedules, other re realignment committee, or any any other entities or bodies that need this decision to be brought up June the 11th? There's no other body involved. I mean, it's our decision, but right. Um, yeah. Because yeah. as we know, the city, I know there were, there were suggestions about the city of Concord, but they don't fund anything with public schools in, in the state right. of North Carolina. It, they have no responsibility. Is it six of one and a half dozen yeah. of the other June the 11th versus early July? Yeah. I think we can go maybe, I'll say, kind of in the middle. Let's put it on the agenda for next week if questions are not answered. And that assumes you have timely feedback questions by Wednesday night. So not Friday, not Sunday night. But Wednesday night, <laughs> we need to stay focused on that. <clears throat> Given the level of um, involvement from the community, I, I just don't think that seven days is enough time for <laughs> us to um, kind of process what we've been able to hear tonight um, and, and other meetings. Um, I, I feel more comfortable with that vote being in July. Okay. Well, if you make the vote in July, it will not be in the country, so I will not be able to, to vote on it. Yeah, we need a full July, board. So. I think we all have to be here for that one. So. Call the question. Okay, all in favor of moving the vote or putting the vote on the July agenda, say aye. Aye. And how many do we have? Robin Vince. Mm -hmm. um, Carolyn, your thoughts? I would go July, but you said, Barry, when are you going to be back? I won't be back. In, I won't be back until the fifth, the Monday the fifteenth. I'll be back in town. Yeah, and we have the meeting the week before. Yeah, we, we also oh, have Monday the sixteenth. We have a late June meeting also. Yeah, we, yeah, we have do have. Late, yeah, we have but one that's not a June for the regular business meeting. meeting well, we can make it whatever. It's on the schedule. I know. It's, I've, it's yeah. only on the schedule for that one item, and right. we had kind of reserved it for appeals which we could abandon that. <laughs> yes, we could. <laughs> I just think, I mean, if we do policies, we, we have a first read of a policy, we wait a month, and then we vote again. Again, this mm -hmm. is, we're introducing something. It should have a little more time to, to get more feedback if we need Well, we it. actually vote on the policy the next week. <clears throat> it just has policies required two readings. Yeah, but so, it doesn't go into effect until the following month, you generally. Okay, so the motion, or the vote, all in favor say, on putting on the July agenda, say no. 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 Wait, what was the okay. Uh, I guess three. Three yeses. You're voting twice. What are you doing? We're voting for it to finish this motion on adding the vote to the July agenda. I will vote to add it to the July agenda. Yes. So you three voted yes. And I believe down here we have no's? No's. No's. Okay. Um, well, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we add it to the last item that we have in June, which is the Wednesday? Thursday the 28th. Okay. I'll okay. second that motion. Well, that'd be fine. Can everybody be here for the 28th? I will make it. Did you have okay. a second? Well, that gives me I, I didn't get a second. There was a second from Oh, you did. Okay. Thank so, you. Mr. Shoemaker made the motion for June 28th, and Dr. Kirk okay. seconded. Yeah. All in favor, say aye to that aye. motion. Aye. Aye. That's good. That makes more time. Okay. So, June 28th, and we will make that. Um, Is that similar? I don't know if it'll be a tradition. Who okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Me. Huh? One. No. One. Six one. Okay. 
with Mr. Powell dissenting. Okay. And then that will be considered. Um, that meeting at I'm sorry? That June 28th meeting starts at 530. Um, that's probably okay. 530, we're already planning on it anyways because of the budget. So, and that will be a special call meeting, not a traditional business meeting. So, okay. So, we're all settled on that. So, June 28th. I thought I saw a hand going up over there. Um, so now, uh, I will call for motions to convene in closed session. Uh, pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body, which privilege is hereby acknowledged and pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A6 to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of an initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee, or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge, or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee to review personnel recommendations. And Rich, is there anything special tonight? Uh, yes, you also need to go in uh, uh, pursuant to 143.318.11A5 uh, to establish or instruct the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the price and other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for acquisition of real property. Okay. So move. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Kirk made the motion, and who seconded? Mr. Harrison seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so 7-0. Thank you.